Hello everyone, in today's video I will be narrating stories that I found off of reddit. If you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But without further ado, let's get straight into these stories. A few years ago, I was renting a house in Northern California. The neighborhood was just outside the suburbs. It seemed like the perfect balance of having space and having nice neighbors close enough to not feel isolated. The area had no streetlights, so it was very dark at night, especially if there were no clouds blocking the moonlight. It didn't bother me though. It made my little house feel even more quaint on dark nights. I got home from work one day in midwinter. It was a cloudy night, so pulling up to my house, I saw only what my headlights and front porch light illuminated. When I got out of my car, I caught a whiff of cigarette smoke. That was odd, as I had never smelled that before around the house. I didn't see anyone nearby, so I ignored it and went inside. I had just got off a shift with a few hours of overtime, so I felt pretty tired. Even though it wasn't even 7 yet, I decided to take a shower and call it a night. I woke up sometime later sure that I had heard a noise inside my house. I wasn't worried right away because my friend would sometimes stop by to use my shower after work on his way to his night classes. I even gave him a spare key so he could stop by even if I wasn't home. He would always text me to let me know beforehand though, and I hadn't heard my phone go off. I reached over to my bedside table and picked up my cell phone to see if my friend had sent me a text. The bright light from my phone's screen and number pad blinded me. Through squinted eyes, I could make out it was a 9 or something, but I couldn't tell if I had an unread text or not. I set my phone aside and called out my friend's name. There were a couple seconds of silence before I heard loud footfalls as someone started running through the bottom floor of my house. I leapt out of bed and ran to the closet. They were already up the stairs by the time I had opened the door and stepped inside. That house had three rooms upstairs, two bedrooms on either side of the hallway, the one that was in a spare, and a bathroom at the end. The bedroom doors were both closed, but the bathroom door was cracked open. I heard whoever was in my house thunder down the hallway past my door and into the bathroom. Thank god they did. They gave me enough time to open the attic access in the ceiling of my closet and hoist myself up. I just started to lift myself up when the person ran back out of the bathroom. My feet were barely inside of the attic when my bedroom door burst open. I heard footsteps run into my room and stop. When they didn't see me in that room, they ran back to the hallway and into the other room, which just had boxes stacked in a corner, some weights, and a table where I painted my miniature models. I guess they decided that if someone were hiding, it would be in the bedroom because they charged back into my room and turned on the light. A moment later, the closet door was ripped open. I was crouched on my attic just a foot or so away from the access, so I could try to stop them if they had started to climb up. From my vantage point, all I could see was from about their knee down. They were wearing dirty blue jeans with frayed cuts and worn work boots. After a few seconds of looking into the closet, they stepped away and I heard a loud crash come from my room followed by a scream of frustration and anger. That scream was the most unnerving part of the incident for me. Whoever it was in my house ran back down the stairs. I heard crashes and clatters as things were thrown around and furniture was knocked over. I stayed crouched in the attic. I had left my cell phone when I ran for the closet and I wasn't certain I could climb down without him hearing. After some time, the noise had stopped. I started counting slowly and when I reached a thousand, I decided it was safe enough to climb down and call the police. The first thing I noticed when I exited the closet was the intruder had flipped my bed over. I assumed in an attempt to find me. That was the last noise I heard after they stepped away from the closet. I couldn't find my cell phone, so I went to the landline by the bed and called the police. I waited in my room until I heard them call from downstairs. The first floor was a mess, but I expected that. Chairs had been knocked over, the sofa had been flipped, all the books, pictures, and knickknacks I had on my shelves were strewn all over the floor. The cupboards in the kitchen had been opened and all the boxes and canned foods had been thrown to the ground. As far as I could tell though, the only thing missing was a single knife out of the wooden block in my kitchen. The police checked the house from top to bottom. They also found a few cigarette butts along my fence line, along with some foil and an empty pin tube which the police said people often use to smoke meth with, so they think they had been watching my house for a while. I realized that they must have been out there smoking a cigarette when I got home. They collected up the evidence and told me I should stay with my family or friends that night and get that door fixed as soon as possible. I opted to just not sleep. I moved a shelf over to block the broken door and spent the next couple hours cleaning things up. I would often go to the window with a flashlight and shine it along the fence line where the police found the cigarette butts and foil, but I didn't see anything. The next day I called to have the door fixed and motion lights installed at the back and sides of my house. I lived there another three years without incident. My boyfriend, who I live with, works as a teacher in a town about 15 minutes away by train. He gets home more or less at the same time every day, give or take an hour or so. I, on the other hand, work from home. In late January of this year, we got in a pretty big fight about something stupid. I can't remember what it was by now, but it was one of those fights where we didn't speak to each other, text, or call, or anything the whole next day. So this afternoon I was lying in bed getting work done. It was a Tuesday and I'm pretty sure his last class finished at 1pm on Tuesdays, meaning he'd surely be home at 2.30. But around 1pm I heard the front door open and shut. I thought, huh, I guess he's home an hour early today. 
It was normal for him to skip his class every once in a while, so I didn't really think anything of it. In fact, I was mostly mentally preparing for the awkward post-fight, hey, how's it going conversation. So I continued to lie in bed and do my work and wait for him to come in and change his clothes. The bedroom door was closed and I had earplugs sort of half in, as I usually do when I'm working. But I could hear the heavy footsteps of him walking around the apartment, as he always does. If we hadn't been mid-fight and I wasn't so preoccupied with the awkwardness of all of it, I might have noticed it was strange how slow the footsteps were or how long he spent walking around the living room. But I was caught up in the dramatics of the fight and didn't think about it. I was just lying there, waiting, waiting, and waiting for him to finally come in. Finally, the bedroom door slowly opened just a few inches. I turned my head towards the door and prepared to give him a sort of awkward, we've been fighting for 24 hours, huh, smile. But the door didn't open more than a few inches. I looked and saw that it was a woman's hand with red nail polish on the doorknob. Whoever was there slowly closed the door just as they opened it, without entering the room. I jumped out of bed, ripped out my earplugs, and sort of froze there for a few seconds while thinking rapidly. My first thought, that was not my boyfriend. Then I thought, could that have been his mom, his sister, the landlady? For some reason, I concluded that surely it was his mom or sister. So I opened the bedroom door and walked into the living room. There wasn't anyone there, but the room smelled heavily of women's perfume. Then I came to my senses and realized, his mom and sister don't have keys and have never come before. The landlady has never entered without permission. This was a stranger. I went back into my bedroom and shut the door, now shaking heavily. There was a balcony connected to the bedroom so despite the cold January rain, I stood on the balcony and called my boyfriend. He picked up and I asked him if his mom or sister might have come over unannounced. He told me, no, don't move, I'm calling the police. The police were there in minutes and searched the whole apartment. Of course, nobody was there by this point. It was weird though. Nothing was missing from the apartment despite us keeping a jar full of money right in the entrance. Nothing was even touched. In fact, it seemed like the intruder came straight in the bedroom, saw my legs on the bed, panicked, and left. Plus, you can't open that big wooden front door without a key. Nevertheless, we demanded that the landlady change her locks. When she came to change them with her husband, she made a discovery. There was a square area by the keyhole that had been scratched away with something. The landlady said surely someone used tools to break into the apartment. I never got to meet the person who opened the door that day, and I hope I never do. Okay, this happened in 2016 when I was a 17 year old first year college student in film school. I lived alone in my first ever apartment. I never felt unsafe in this apartment for several reasons. There were multiple gates in the residence that needed to be opened through a code only the people who lived there knew, and my door had three different locks and it was right next to the university, so most people who lived in the neighborhood were college students. Nothing bad had ever happened in the neighborhood before. I've always been very careful with locking the door when I leave my home. I always check it twice. So this one time, I leave to go to class and lock my door but for some reason I couldn't get the key out of the lock. It was completely stuck so I went to get the caretaker of the building to help me, but he wasn't there and I was getting late for class, so I went to class with the key still in the lock. I took off the keychain first so it's not too noticeable. When I got home, the caretaker was back so he came to help me, and we couldn't get it off for 15 minutes until somehow he did. He told me the lock was damaged but that I didn't necessarily need to change it if I only locked it once instead of twice. I just said okay and that was the end of it. I really wasn't worried because of how safe I felt in this building. Flash forward to two months later, I was taking out the trash one night around 11pm. While on the phone with my sister, I remember telling her that I was taking out the trash. Then I would take a shower afterwards before heading to a party. As I previously said I always locked the door, even just to take out the trash. Because of my lock being damaged, I only locked it once. When I got back to my apartment, I found the door unlocked, which immediately alarmed me. So I went to the apartment and locked the door immediately, with three different types of locks. When you walk into my apartment, which is just 215 square feet, you have the main room in front of you and the bathroom door immediately to your left. I left the bathroom door slightly open, enough so I could see a man in my shower, turning his back to me. Naturally, when I saw this, I tried to open the door and leave as fast as possible except my main lock was damaged from two months earlier and I couldn't open it no matter how hard I tried. In this moment, all I could think of was the fact that I had to leave as fast as possible. I jumped out the window without really thinking. I figured it was the only solution, except I'd live on the second floor, so I completely smashed my ankles in the landing. I started running in whichever way I could, and when I got a little bit further from the building, I looked back and a man was there, at my window, watching me run away. I thought of two possible outcomes. Either the man was going to jump and chase me, except I wouldn't get far with my twisted ankles, or he would get scared of the height and be locked in my apartment. Thankfully, he picked option two. I went to hide in a bush a little further and called the police, who arrived in just 10 minutes because I lived close to the station. They pushed my door open and the man was there just sitting on my couch, holding a kitchen knife, waiting for me to come back, like he didn't think I would call the police. They arrested the guy and later told me he had already been arrested for attempted kidnapping and attempted murder. They also told me how everything had happened. 
Like I said, it was a very friendly neighborhood with mostly college students, so he got inside the building by other people holding the door for him. He then heard me telling my sister I was going to take a shower, which was why he was waiting in the bathroom for me. He crocheted my lock while I was taking out the trash. He apparently noticed me on my school campus and followed me to my home several times before succeeding to actually come in. He stayed inside waiting for me because I had recently changed my phone and the previous one was still on the table, so he thought I didn't have a phone with me to call the police. I don't live there anymore, but after that, to get into the building, we all needed identification proving we lived there. Building IDs were created and we had to scan them every time and it was the only way to go inside the building. Nothing really bad happened in the neighborhood after that. It's back to being very peaceful and friendly. A friend and I played after school hockey. It wasn't a popular sport so our games took place at another school which is incredibly far away and pretty much in the middle of nowhere. The area didn't have any train stations so we relied on three different buses to get there and again to get home. The games usually took place pretty late and ended around 7 to 8 p.m. when it was dark. All the other girls in our team got picked up by their parents, but we always busted together home. We didn't feel it was dangerous because there were two of us and being classic 12 year olds, we thought we were mature enough to be independent. Because we had to change buses three times and we lived so far away, by the time we got to our second bus stop it was usually pitch black. The second bus stop was desolate, far off from the school, in front of some kind of abandoned building and basically a bit creepy. The stop was small, it wasn't sheltered, it was just a steel pole with a bus painted on the sign. On this particular night, it wasn't raining as well, so we felt extra miserable standing out in the cold. The buses in my area are also notoriously unreliable, so it wasn't unusual for us to wait an hour at this bus stop. That night it definitely felt like we had been waiting there for over an hour when a car pulled up in front of us. A woman was in it. She rolled down her window and asked us where we were going. I told her the suburb we lived in, which was an hour drive away and she said she could give us a lift if we wanted. If it had been a man, I would have immediately been suspicious and liked it. But because she was a youngish woman, looked about 40, it didn't raise any red flags in my mind. I remember thinking that she must be understandably worried about two young girls standing out in the rain at night. I smiled and thanked her and said it was okay, and we would wait for the bus. She hesitated and then drove away. But a few minutes later, she came back and pulled up in front of us again. She told us her daughter wasn't at a play and that she was going there anyway to pick her up, so are we sure we didn't want to lift? My friend was almost about to get in, but I hesitated. Maybe thanks to my parents drilling me about stranger danger, and I said thank you, but it was alright, we'll wait. She was a bit pushier this time and asked us if we were sure quite a few times and mentioned her daughter again, but eventually she drove away. At this point, I think my intuition was telling me that it felt a bit weird that she hadn't mentioned her daughter earlier. Another few minutes later, she came back again. This time, she said that she had just driven past our bus further down the road and then it obviously skipped our stop, so she offered to give us a lift to try to catch up to it. This sounded unlikely to me. By this point, I was super suspicious. I didn't really have any time to think, so it was just a bad gut feeling, rather than any logical reasoning. With all the politeness and smiles gone, I straight up just said no. I could tell my friend, who was about to get into her car before, was also starting to feel weird about it because she backed away from the road. The woman hesitated for a while. It lapsed into an awkward silence and I remember she just kept glancing at her back seat. I remember holding my hockey stick tight and playing in my brain how I was going to defend myself. It honestly felt like forever before she finally drove away. A few minutes later the bus came and I had never been so relieved in my life. By this point, we were absolutely soaked. To this day, I still don't know whether she was just worried, a good Samaritan, or a potential kidnapper. I flip between the two and honestly I can't decide. My friend also thinks it's a mystery, but we don't know if we were just being paranoid. This was around 2015 and I was living in Seattle. I worked in an office that allowed me to bring my dog to work. A 100 pound German Shepherd. He's a big sweetheart but looks quite scary to strangers. After work one day, I got on the bus home, which was around a 45 minute ride. I noticed someone stared at me and didn't think much of it. While it's unsettling to be watched, I've had my fair share of odd conversations on the bus and it wasn't out of the ordinary to encounter such weird behavior. I honestly don't remember too much about his appearance, but I do remember thinking he looked fairly normal and didn't seem high or drunk. My bus stop was on a busy street in a bit of a sketchier part of town, but it's not frequently trafficked. When we reached the stop, my dog and I set off on the short trek home, only a few blocks away. As I exited the bus, I noticed the man who had been watching me had exited too. Something was off about him. He seemed intent on keeping stride with me, trailing closely behind. I've heard advice somewhere in the past that you shouldn't go straight home if you're being followed. I'm sure that's situation specific and sometimes it's safer to be in your home, but nothing had happened besides having my personal space invaded and didn't feel immediately unsafe. So I opted not to leave this stranger straight to my door. I knew that my partner at the time wasn't at home, so I decided the best plan was to weave through my neighborhood for several blocks to try to lose him. I think a part of me was also wanting to be sure I was being followed at all or if this person just happened to be walking in the same direction. After several blocks, it became clear he was following me. I was weaving around erratically and he was walking the same path. 
Neither of us spoke to one another and I was becoming more and more frustrated that anyone would follow a woman home. The streets were quiet and I couldn't see anybody around who I could signal to for help. I don't think I would have been so surprised this was happening if I was alone and without my dog. I can't imagine anyone in their right mind following someone with a large German Shepherd. I started walking faster when I rounded a corner and quickly ducked into a hallway, hugging a duplex a block from my house. I was hoping the pathway would wrap around the house completely so I could get out of the line of sight of this person, but was met with a fence to my face and didn't have time to backtrack. I was ultimately cornered in this nook between a house, a fence, and a hedge. I crouched down with my dog and waited for the guy to pass us. I watched as the man strolled by the walkway, seemingly not noticing us at all. He didn't turn his head or even gaze in our direction. I decided that we'd stay there for a few minutes just to make sure he was gone. About three minutes went by. Just as I was thinking it was safe to head home, the man stepped into my line of sight. He didn't make eye contact with me, just as he had it in the first time he walked by. He was moving calmly and deliberately, and slowly came to a stop as soon as he was right in front of me, just off the curb. He was about two yards away, facing me, and not directly looking, with just a sidewalk and a grassy strip between us. I watched him as he started to unload his pockets. He had a number of metal objects he was taking out, placing them in a line. To this day, I'm not sure what they were, but I'm glad I didn't find out. At this point, I called 911 and told them what was happening, that someone was following me and showing erratic behavior. The cops made it there quickly, and as soon as they pulled up, the dispatcher advised me to get out of there. I hightailed it out of my hiding spot and took a non-direct path home since my house was technically in the line of sight of where I was crouched. I don't know what ended up happening with him, but fortunately never saw him again, and I don't know if he had malicious intent. This happened when both me and my friend Jay were 15. I was spending the night at his house, as I often did. It was a normal enough night, we watched movies, played a couple video games, and stayed up way too late. It was about 2am I think when we heard a loud banging coming from the front door. Luckily at the time we were in his kitchen at the back of the house, so no one could see us. We were spooked because there couldn't have been anyone at the door at this hour, but we figured it was just some drunk person and they'd go away soon enough. After 30 seconds, there was more banging on the door and yelling that neither of us could understand. It sounded like an adult man, and he sounded angry so we both were scared. He texted his mom, who we thought was upstairs, but she said that she had just left a bit before without saying anything. She did that often enough. She liked to go to her friend's houses in the middle of the night, so we didn't pay any attention or notice when she left. We didn't know what to do, as we were scared to call the police based off past experiences with cops in our small town being not the best. At this point, we turned off the kitchen light and we were ducked down on the ground. We heard the banging and yelling getting louder, and I decided to see who it was, if it was anyone we knew. I army crawled through the dining room, which was also dark and peeked through the door to the living room, which is where the front door was. There was also a huge window by the door that you can see right into the dining room though, so I was very careful not to be seen. I couldn't see any details of the man, but he looked to be about 6 feet tall and had gray hair. I crawled back to Jay and we quietly decided what to do. We heard the knocking stop, so we decided to wait a bit before seeing if it was safe. We also decided to go around the table in the dining room, in case he tried to come around back, which was where the kitchen was. After around 10 minutes of silence, we rock paper scissors for who had to check if he was there, and of course I lost. So I again army crawled to the dining room door. I saw the man staring through the window, hands cupped up against the glass. I made eye contact with him, and the moment he saw me, and I loudly said, causing my friend to panic and crawl behind me. I saw him pull out his phone, and he told me later that he was texting his mom to come home and save us. The man started yelling again, and this time we could make out a bit of more of what he said. It was mostly cussing, although I definitely heard the phrase, I'm gonna kill you, in there a couple times. I quickly looked past the man to see if any of the neighbors seemed to notice him, but no luck. I crawled back out of his sight and again discussed what to do with my friend. We decided to go into the basement for safety, which you could get to by moving the fridge. Confusing house I know, but it was really old and not meant for modern sized appliances. We pull out the fridge and get into the basement, feeling mostly safe but still terrified. I start having a panic attack, although I'm trying to hold it together best I can for Jay, who is also on the verge of a panic attack. We hear a gunshot and shattering glass from above us, and I cover my mouth so I don't scream. Jay and I look at each other, terrified. We hear loud footsteps and yelling above us, the man asking where we went. We hear him going upstairs and run around up there for a bit. He eventually comes back down and starts turning over our furniture, I'm assuming to find us. After what felt like hours, but was probably only minutes. Jay's mom pulls into the driveway, which scares the guy as he runs out the back door in the kitchen. Jay and I get out of the basement and run to greet his mom, never happier to see her. She was shocked by the state of the house and hugged us, happy that we were safe and scared by how close we were to being hurt. We were all scared after that. After that night they had better security installed, and we went over safety protocol if anything ever happened again. Luckily it hasn't happened again yet, and I hope it never will. I work at a convenience store. 
I've had some creepy customers come in before, but this one was a little more disturbing. If it weren't for what had been said and done, I don't think this would have been that bad. I normally work third shift, which is around 4pm to around 12am, and I'm by myself for the last 4 hours of my shift. This man had come in earlier that day and was acting odd, jittery, chewing at his lip constantly, fumbling with his debit card, to the point I did everything for him except putting the pen in. Fast forward to around 10.30pm, I'm sweeping the floors as I'm supposed to do every night when the man entered. He approached my register and I asked him what he needed. Hey, can I have one of those lighters? I pick one up and go to scan it, but he tells me that he doesn't have any money. I tell him he can't have it and he glares at me before leaving. A man was in line behind him and the entire time I was scanning his things, the lighter guy was staring at me through the window right next to my register. He eventually walks off and the man jokes about the creepy guy asking for a lighter when the man in line didn't even have his with him. He tells me to be safe, then walks out to the gas station pumps. I start sweeping again, but when I turn around and move a small crate out of the way, the creepy guy is staring at me again, just watching me work. I quickly make my way to the back room to make mop water so I could get away from him for a second. He stayed there for a solid 5 minutes before stalking off again. I grabbed a random receipt as a cover and basically bolted to the man at the gas pumps. I got close and asked if he was in a hurry to go anywhere. I told him that the creepy lighter guy was still hanging around and that it was really freaking me out. He promises me that he didn't plan on actually leaving after getting gas. At this point, I thought it wouldn't take up too much of his time, since we both thought the man was already wandering away from the store. Unfortunately, he went back toward the store a few seconds later. Soon, an older woman comes in and I warn her about the creepy guy. She asked what I was talking about and I subtly nod in his direction. Mind you, still hanging around my window. She looks a little disturbed, leaning in and whispering, What does he want? I explained that he wanted a lighter, but he didn't have any money so I didn't give him one. I told her to be careful and she quickly told me to worry more about myself since I was at the store alone. She left, and I saw the creepy guy approach the window again. Thankfully, he didn't look in, just hung around it like he was waiting for someone. After a while, a daughter of a family friend comes in with her girlfriend, and we quietly make small talk. Like the last woman, I warned them that the lighter guy was still roaming around and he could be dangerous. Before they get to tell me anything, a woman was talking with the guy from the gas pumps, spotted them while scanning family friend's items, and hurried in and told me to call the cops. Obviously, not familiar with the area I worked in and hearing three different people tell me what numbers to call, I was shaking and in near tears. My family friend said she would call while I calmed down. Another girl had run out at this point, and I don't blame her. Family friend's girlfriend told me that lighter guy threatened to throw rocks through the window and hurt slash rob me. After about three minutes of pacing and trying not to cry, I saw my mom's truck pull in. I bolted to her, telling her what was going on. She calmed down and walks me back to the entrance. As this happened, creepy guy had climbed the hill and crossed the street to Bojangles and sat near the front door. The cops arrived. The man from the pumps gave a statement, I gave mine. And finally, family friend gave hers, which included the threats. From what was said, he was about to break into my car. The man that stayed with me stopped him, but that didn't stop the creep from roaming still. After we talked to the cops, they sped to Bojangles and confronted the lighter guy. After arguing, a quit pat down and more arguing, the man was put in the back of the cop car. Lighter guy, I knew you were probably on something, but please, let's not meet ever again. To set this story, I bike 5 miles one day, 5 days a week to my job, and I've been for 8 months. I honestly love it. It forces me to get exercise, and it's cheap transportation. I take the main road with a lot of traffic, so I've never felt unsafe. I also only ride on the sidewalk, since it's safer. One day, coming home, I was passing by an area with a lot of construction going on. To give you a better visual, I ride on the sidewalk along a busy road. As I'm biking, I see a man in a black pickup truck parked as if he's about to pull out of the area, but he's waiting for a spot to open in traffic. He then sees me and reverses to let me by. I remember thinking, oh great, he's letting me by, and I wouldn't have to ride around behind his car to get to the other side. But as I'm getting closer, he does a stop motion with his hand, and he's wearing a safety vest, so I assume he works there, and there might be a problem up ahead, like a pothole, etc., so I stop. He spoke with authority like as if he's an officer stopping me or something and asked if I bike for transport or leisure. I was a little confused since that's a weird question but I tell him for transport, I bike to my job. He then says, do you bike for leisure? I'm asking because I bought a bike and I'm looking for a riding buddy. I'm not freaking out or anything. I feel a little calm since there are a bunch of cars passing by us so we're not secluded but I don't know this man. He's a complete stranger and I was under the impression he worked there and was stopping me for something important. I tell him not really because I'm too tired on my days off and use them to get errands and stuff done. He says, oh I get it. Well there's a bike marathon happening soon if you want to go with me. I'm Shane by the way. What's your name? 
I tell him my name and say, oh, I don't know, I might be busy then. I'm a little awkward in social situations with people I don't know, and this whole interaction was just off, so I don't really know what to say. He changes the subject and starts looking at my bike. He points at it and asks if it's a hybrid. I say yes, and he says, can I see it? And starts getting out of his car. This is where it starts getting weird. He tells me he's seen me riding before and I thought I was cute. He's also looking at my bike and commenting on it and saying stuff like, oh, that's nice, it's aluminum, and I'm just feeling weird on the inside. I'm also sitting on my bike ready to get the f out of there. He then asks if I have a boyfriend and I tell him yes I do. He lets out a big groan and says, oh man, really? Because if we go biking together, it would be kind of a date thing. I tell him yeah, sorry, and he goes, are you sure? Are you ready to kick him to the curb or what? I just want to get out of here at this point, but he parked his car literally in front of the sidewalk, so it wouldn't be that easy to speed by him. He seemed upset and kept asking if I'm sure I have one and how long we've been together. I said, a couple years. Well, I'm crunched for time and I have to go, bye, and sped off. After that, I had a mini vacation and was off for five days after that, but now I'm back to riding to work again and I haven't seen him since. This probably happened maybe three or four weeks ago. So creepy older man who tricked me and blocked me on my bike, let's not ever meet again. This was back in 2014. I had moved off campus and into a really nice part of town. I was a junior in college and this was my first time living on my own. Campus was only two miles away so I would often walk back home from campus. I would take the bus or catch a ride with a friend to campus. I walked home because my schedule ending never quite matched up with the bus schedule and my friend finished two hours before my daily schedule did. I was used to walking the two miles to my apartment. I never thought anything of it because I walked through the busy area of my town, along the second main road. So there were always people around. My apartment was actually a stone throw from the most popular frozen custard shop in the area. Every night the parking lot would be packed. So I'm walking home like usual. I get to the frozen custard shop and notice there's a lot of people tonight. It was just something I always noticed and paid attention to. All of a sudden this huge red truck pulls up beside me. I'm cut off guard because I have headphones in. It takes about 30 minutes to an hour to walk home, so I'm normally listening to music or talking on the phone. I stop and take my headphones out and look at the truck. This man dressed like a country singer was sitting in the driver's seat. He looks at me and asks where the mall is. I put him in the direction to the mall. He said, I've been down that way. I'm a photographer and I'm supposed to be doing a photo shoot at a bar behind the mall. I've lived in this town going on three years now. I know where all the bars are located. Makes it easy when all of them are on the same street. I explained to him, there's no bars by the mall. They're all on Philly Street. He continued to insist on a bar being behind the mall. All of a sudden, he just changes. He looked at me and asked me to step back. So I did. He looked me over and asked how tall I was. I told him 5'7". He then asked me, I'm doing that photo shoot. Would you like to be a model for it? I told him I don't like any of my photos taken. He insisted, telling me I was beautiful and would look great. Almost like he's given up on the tactic, he moves to another. He then asked me where I live. I told him not far. He wanted more info. I pointed in the vague vicinity in my apartment, making a point not to actually point at it. This dude then asked me if I wanted a ride. I told him no, it's not far, I'll be fine. He kept insisting I let him give me a ride home. I kept telling him no, stepping farther away from his truck. He then out of nowhere asked me how he could get to the mall. I told him, go down this road, at the light turn left. The mall will be on your left. He thanked me and started to drive off. I walked slowly to my apartment. I watched his truck get to the light. Instead of turning left like I said, he went straight. Going straight leads into a small residential area that you need to know this town well to get through. I lived in that town from 2012 to 2017 and still can't figure my way through that area. I made sure that that truck was completely out of sight before I hightailed it to my apartment and locked the door. My dog didn't quite understand what was going on. All he really knew was he had to go to the bathroom pretty bad. I tried to distract him for 5 or 10 minutes to make sure the coast was clear. My heart sunk when I did finally take him out. The same red truck was parked near the parking lot behind my apartment building. The truck didn't belong there. I'm one that memorizes all the vehicles that are normal for the area. No one had a red truck like that. I went back in and texted people describing the man and the truck to them in case something happened to me. I did not go back out for hours. When I did, the truck was gone. I never saw the man or the truck ever again. To the man who probably tried to abduct me in front of the most popular venue in town on my way home, I hope I never see you again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. Okay, before I get into the story, there's a few things I need to explain about my country. South Africa, for you to fully understand the story. In South Africa, it's normal to have high brick walls with electric gates, electric fences, alarms, etc. The crime here is hectic. It's also pretty normal to have big gardens. My family and I are big animal lovers, so at the time we had six dogs. Two Sharpays, two German short hair pointers, and two Dachshunds. 
With that being said, our dogs roam freely in and out of the garden, as it's obviously enclosed. We usually leave the veranda door open during the day for them to do their thing. Another thing about South Africa, it's normal to have a live-in domestic worker, maid, and gardener. Like, the average family usually employs them. It's not only for wealthy people, which seems to be a thing in other countries. For the story, our DW is Ellie, and our gardener is Vince. So, this happened in 2007 when I was just 9 years old. My older brother, who was 10, and I had just gotten our first cell phones that day. My dad surprised us after work. You may think it's a bit young, but it was used for emergencies or to communicate with our parents. Anyways, it's an important piece of info for the story. We don't usually leave our veranda door open at night, due to security reasons, but I remember it being a hot summer night that night. So of course, this night of all nights, the veranda door was wide open and the dogs were doing their thing in the garden. My brother and I were in my parents' room setting up our new cell phones, all excited. Ellie's daughter Anne, who was like an older sister to us, 18 years old, was helping my brother and I. My dad was somewhere in the house and my mom was in the bath. I specifically remember Anne having a comment about how the dogs would not shut up and how annoying it was. That's when I noticed it too. Sure, they'd bark, but it was usually the dog shuns that yapped, when the bigger dogs just chilled. Plus, it would only happen for a few minutes, then they'd get over it. Something was different that night, as even the bigger dogs were barking nonstop. My dad appeared in his room and mentioned to us that he too noticed the dogs' incessant barking and he was going to check if everything was okay. No alarm bells went off in my head and I don't believe my dad thought anything was amiss either because my brother asked to investigate with them and my dad agreed. I was obviously too engrossed in my new Sony Ericsson. My dad ventured out to our garden with my brother in tow when my dad had noticed the dogs were all grouped, growling and going nuts at a dark corner behind our in the ground swimming pool. The best way I can describe it is that our garden beyond our pool hits like a slight decline. So we have a few steps leading down the hill to the bottom end of our garden. We usually have a lamp that lights it up, but my dad had noticed how the lamp seemed to be off, which confused him because he could have sworn it worked the other night. Either way, my dad said he got this gut-wrenching feeling because of this and because of how out of the character the dogs were acting. He called after them, they'd usually come running, but tonight, they all just seemed to look at him, then turn back around and continue to go crazy at this dark corner down the steps. My dad told my brother to go back inside the house and get a torch sort of using it as an excuse for my brother to not come out with him because of this off feeling. When my brother went back inside, my dad slowly approached the steps. He noticed how the dogs seemed to be snapping at whatever it was, hiding just out in the view in the darkness. As he got to the steps, he noticed the lamp was smashed. Confused, he inched the steps and as he put two and two together, he was too late. My dad, being an ex-vet and an avid hunter, felt something cold against his temple and immediately knew it was a gun. Out of the darkness stepped four of the men in balaclavas all armed. Shocked, he stood frozen on the steps. The man holding the gun to his head was instantly aggressive and asked him where my brother was. That he saw my dad come out with my brother, but my brother went back into the house. My dad said something came over him and before he knew what he was saying, he responded with, he's gone inside to press the panic button. As he said it, he saw how all these guys started to panic. They started speaking in an African language called Zulu. Assuming my dad couldn't understand, it's not common for white people to speak it, but my dad had actually grown up on a farm where he learned it fluently because of the farm workers. The aggressive guy holding the gun said, in Zulu, the cops will be here any minute. Let's just kill this f grab what we can, and go. The others seemed apprehensive, and a smaller guy seemed really on edge. It continued to say how he can't go back to jail again, and they need to get the f out of there before the cops show, which would be any minute. He was panicking. My dad then fed on this guy's fear. My dad then interrupted them, speaking English, pretending to not understand what they were saying, and said that we usually have armed response vehicles that drove in our area, and since my brother pushed the panic button so long ago, they'll probably be here any second. And that did it. My dad watched as their plan unraveled before them. The smaller scared guy started freaking out all the other guys, saying that they need to leave ASAP or else they'd get caught. He seemed to make the others more nervous and lose confidence until they started full on bickering amongst themselves. Their plan slowly turning to as a third guy had put it. The aggressive one pointing the gun to my dad's head slowly lowered it as they started fighting, losing focus on my dad and shifting his focus onto his crew. My dad then used this as an opportunity to slowly back up the steps and turn to dart to the house. As luck would have it, as my dad ran into the veranda door, my oblivious brother was heading out with a torch. My dad scooped him up under his arm mid-ran and sprinted into the house, not even closing the door behind him. Silly, I know, but I think he just wanted to get my brother inside as quick as possible without even thinking. Anne and I were obviously also oblivious to everything. When my dad rushed to the bedroom door, slammed it shut, and told us to go upstairs into the attic, quote unquote, there's five guys outside with guns. They're here to hurt us. Get upstairs now. My heart sank. I remember my body automatically responding and me sprinting to the stairs with Anne right behind. My mom ran out of the bathroom in a towel not too far behind. We sat there in darkness and silence. I swear you could hear a pin drop. I think we were all just wanting to hear something below us in the rooms. 
My mom cursed saying she didn't have a phone, neither did my dad. But ha, in my hand was my brand new Sony Ericsson. No better emergency to use it than now, right? My mom dials the police and I kid you not, they asked where we live, we explained and they told us it wasn't in their jurisdiction. Sorry, click, the line goes dead. We're now not only ourselves, but we're flabbergasted too. My mom starts cursing like a sailor again and that's when my dad realizes. He didn't close the veranda door and what about Ellie and Vince, who are in their rooms, blissfully unaware of the danger they're in. He gets his firearm and the safe in the attic and tells us whatever we hear, do not come downstairs. To stay hidden no matter what. Now I'm sobbing, begging my dad to not leave us, but he tells us he has to go get Eli and Vince before something bad happens to them. Now there's even more tears, as reality hits that there's two other people still in danger. Anne's understandably in hysterics because she's also fearing for her mom downstairs. My dad disappears and the air is thick with tension. We can still hear the dogs going crazy, indicating that those men were still on our property. My mom then calls another number, the armed security that drives around the area, and they say they'll be over in about 10 to 15 minutes. They sit away and stay hidden until they ring our bell at the gate. We all wait in silence, fearing that we'll hear a gunshot or anything indicating these men are in our house. But there was just silence. The only sound was the dog's barks outside. After what seemed like hours, most likely a couple minutes, we heard stomping coming up from the stairs and my heart rate quickened. I remember shutting my eyes and praying that it was just my dad with Ellie and Vince. Luckily, it was. We all hid for a while, no one dared to speak. The dogs seemed to have calmed down considerably, but we were still barking every now and then. The gate intercom rang, and my dad told us to wait while he checked if it was just the security company, and sure enough, it was. He opened up and the nightmare was over. I remember standing up and my knees buckling from the adrenaline my body endured. The armed security somehow notified the right police, and everyone investigated the garden. They found that there was actually seven pairs of footprints and that these guys bent the spikes on our wall and just climbed over. We got an electric fence shortly after, so there must have been two other guys hiding in the shadows that my dad hadn't seen, which is actually creepy in its own right. Thank goodness nothing happened to my family and I'm forever thankful for my dad's quick thinking regarding the panic button. Also, I'm so glad my dad understands Zulu and can manipulate the situation to benefit us. This takes place in the early 80s. I grew up in the suburbs in a very friendly townhouse complex. We all knew our neighbors. My first friends were the kids that lived in other townhouses. To describe my home, all townhomes are attached. They're also very tall and slender. I had six flights of stairs to go from the basement to the bedrooms on the top floor. We had a tiny driveway, and then there was the small roadway. On the other side was a raised flower bed that ran the length of the side of the townhouse wall across the street. The most important thing was a very bright street light in the middle of the planter. It shined ominously right into our front windows at night, and it had enough light to illuminate shapes above the kitchen counter on the third floor kitchen, just the top part of bodies. You didn't need to turn on the kitchen lights at night if you needed to get something. One night I had a sleepover with my friend who lived diagonal to me. Us scouts had stayed up late in which of the kitchen for snacks. I peered out into the street to see an unfamiliar guy walking by on the roadway. There was no sidewalks. I noted to my pal that there was a weirdo walking by because he didn't seem right. He was tall and lanky with long 80s hair. With our familiarity with people in the neighborhood, we didn't recognize him. Our complex roadway did lead to a street, but it wasn't used as a shortcut because it was a long way to get around the neighborhood, so you didn't see others often, especially at night. As soon as I commented to weirdo, he walked by our house. Only a couple of minutes later, he walked by again going in the direction he came on the roadway. This time, we saw him out of the corners of our eyes coming along. Being scared kids, we immediately ducked as we were visible to the street. Up until then, we didn't think anything more of it, but our instincts told us to hide, so we did. My friends said we were overreacting after a few minutes being crouched down, so we carefully peered over the counter. Weirdo hadn't walked by. He was now standing in front of the flower planter looking up at our house. To this day, I remember that bright street light illuminating him from behind very ominously. He looked like a horror film killer come to life. We hit the floor again thoroughly freaked out. I don't know how long we were there for. I could only hear the sound of our breathing for some time, until I thought I heard the squeak of the garage door handle. It was one of those old rusty ones that opened outward. I thought I was dreaming until I heard for the second time that rusty handle squeak. He was trying to get in now. My friend and I were frozen in fear. Luckily, my dad always locked the garage. The squeaking stopped. Even though my friend and I could have run upstairs or shut it to my parents, we were rooted on the spot, thinking if we moved, he'd get us somehow. We thought that was it as it was suddenly quiet. But a few minutes later, I heard the swoosh of the screen door and telltale sound of the front door handle being pressed down. The first screen door was never locked, but thank God the wooden door always was. The noise repeated a few times. The metal scratching of the screen door hinge and the click of the front door latch. I wanted to piss my pants, and my friend looked like crying. Again, we were too silly enough to move or do anything to help ourselves. 
We just shook in terror and hoped he'd go away. He stopped trying to get in after about five minutes, and all we heard after that was silence. About eight minutes later on the kitchen floor, we moved to stand up. I thought we were still pretty crouched down and invisible. That wasn't the case. This time we heard a clear voice. The other kitchen window near the pantry had its screen window open. Hey, I'm thirsty. Can I get a glass of water? My friend and I stared at each other in disbelief. He was still there. We didn't move, but someone had to eventually. My friend being the braver one decided to peek out the screen window while trying not to be seen. He must have heard her. I know you're there. Come on and let me in. I won't hurt you. This was the moment we decided to flee up those two flights of stairs to my bedroom. I always had an active imagination like most kids. I really hated that my bedroom was the very first one at the top of my stairs. My parents were at the back. Therefore, in mind, I would be the first one to be murdered if someone broke in, and that fear was certainly tenfold that very night. My friend and I hunkered down on my bed, deep under the covers, shaking. We did not sleep at all, waiting for the click of a door or worse. We thought we heard him try again, but at that point we weren't sure if we were hearing things. Until the day I moved out, I never really felt totally comfortable in my bedroom ever again. I'm a 21 year old female and this story took place when I was around 11. I remember this day clearly because it was the first time I was ever allowed to walk to school and back by myself. Up until the age of 14 I lived in what we thought was a safe place in Chautauqua County, New York. Everyone knew everyone here. If you thought you would get away with something, then be prepared to have your ear chewed off by the time you get home. There was this one day though, it was a cold winter day and school unfortunately was still open so all the neighborhood kids had to walk through knee-high inches of snow just to get to school. It took me longer to leave the house as I was used to walking with my older sister to school since she knew the routes better than me. I always used to make fun of her for being paranoid and taking a different route every day from school, but after that day, I learned that was what saved my life. As I was waiting by the door to leave, my mom came up to me and told me that I should ride with her to drop me off because my sister was too sick to go today. Being a brat, I made a big deal about walking by myself because I was almost 12 years old and all my friend's parents let them walk alone. She looked at me for a long while, then told me to make sure I pay attention to cars. I got hit by a car and almost died when I was 9, so the worry that showed on her face was well warranted. I hurriedly nodded and headed out the door to go to school. My sister didn't like to dilly dally, so she was always in a rush to get to school early, but seeing as it was just me, I thought it would be a good idea to take my time. I would play in the brown slush that was on the left side of the road, and even made funny looking snowballs to see how far I could throw them. Halfway to school I noticed a white van falling behind me. Being the playful child I was, if I had not been bending down and making another snowball, I wouldn't have noticed it slowly creeping up the street. I told myself I was being stupid, but continued more hurriedly to school. Once I got to school, I took a quick glance over my shoulder and saw the van a few feet behind me. It wasn't until I was on school grounds that it drove away fast by me. I thought that would be the end of it, but throughout the day when I would stare out the window, the van would be there. I assumed that it never really left, just parked. Many adults would try to convince me years later that maybe it wasn't the same one, but I knew it was. The van had a bright yellow smile emoji sticker on it. I couldn't see who was in the van, but through the tinted glass, I knew they could see me. It was now the end of the day and I wasn't ready to go home. It was too late to call my mom, because she was at work and my sister was homesick. I had to suck it up and start walking home. I tried to blend in with the group of kids, but most of them were car riders, and the others didn't live near me. Remembering what my sister told me, I took another route home. I didn't memorize this route clearly, but I decided anything was better than being spotted by that van. I made it to my main street, but realized my mistake too late. The route I took led back to the main street where I walked to school. Hidden behind a row of cars was the white van with a smiley emoji sticker. I tried to stay calm and walk past in, but once I heard the van door slightly click open, I ran. I could hear the rush of two pairs of heavy footfalls behind me. They were getting closer so I did what any normal kid would do. I cut corners. I cut into someone's backyard until I was directly inside of my house and forced myself into the thick snow to make it to the door. My heart was racing, not because I was running, but because I could still hear them behind me. I made it to the door and banged with all my might until someone came to the door. My sister looked confused, but one look at my face and she pulled me inside and locked the doors. The van was still outside. Truthfully, it stayed out there until my brother got home. Me and my sister don't talk about it, but we both knew how close it was to me going missing. Whoever you are that attempted to kin at me and do God knows what else, let's not ever meet again. When I was 20 years old, so six years ago, I worked as a delivery girl for a pretty popular pizzeria in my area. Initially, I worked the late morning to mid afternoon shift, but when the guy who delivered for the night shift ended up getting fired due to him losing his license because of a DUI, I was placed on the night shift since my boss hired a family friend who could only work my shift for whatever reason. I really didn't want this shift because you never know if people who order late at night actually want a pizza or if they have other intentions in mind. Unfortunately, my boss wasn't the nicest of people 
and essentially told me if I wasn't willing to work the night shift, I was fired. I wasn't exactly in a position where I could be out of work, albeit temporarily, so I reluctantly worked the shift. The first month of this shift, I went by without any issues, until I had to deliver a pizza to a house that just barely made our delivery radius. I punched it in on my GPS, and the house was located in a pretty suburban part of the city. I arrive and it's about 11pm. The block was extremely quiet, decently lit, and mostly littered with modern townhouses, but the house I delivered to was a duplex. I ring the doorbell and wait for about 30 seconds. No answer. I ring it again and wait another 30 seconds. Still no answer. I'm standing there getting pretty nervous that something's about to go down, but thankfully a man opens the door. He looked like he was in his late 40s. He was pretty tall, maybe a little over 6 foot, and he was very skinny. I tell him his pizza is here and he just stands there staring at me. I asked him if he was okay and he responded by saying, Yeah, I'm fine, sorry. I got off work not too long ago and I'm just zoning out a bit. Fair enough, I suppose. He hands me the money, I hand him the pizza, and as I'm making change he says, You're really beautiful, you know that? Not really thinking too much into it, I thanked him for the compliment and gave him his change. I said goodnight and he did too. I walked back to my car and finished my deliveries for the night. A few days later, I get a delivery order to the same place. I head over there around the same time as last time and ring the doorbell. He answers the door very excitedly and says, Hey, it's you again. How are you? I told him I was tired and I can't wait to go home to which he chuckled and said, I know that feeling pretty well, as he was pulling out his wallet. As he's counting his money, he asked me what my name is. Being kinda tired at this point and not really thinking straight, I stupidly told him my name. As I'm making change, he asked if he could have my number, as he'd love to hang out with someone as gorgeous as I am. I've literally only met this guy like twice to deliver a pizza. I had no idea who this guy was, and I'm positive he barely knew who I was as well. Another thing to mention is I looked way younger than I was at that time. I was told by numerous people that I still looked like I was 15, and I was hoping he thought differently as he wasn't hitting on what he thought was a teenager. I'm just standing there awkwardly for a few seconds before I muster out, sorry, I have a boyfriend. He gets upset and says, oh okay, I see. We stand there in silence before I tell him to have a good night, and walk back to my car. He says nothing and still stands at the doorway, staring at me, until he finally went back inside once I started my car. I got a pretty creepy vibe from this guy, and even brought it up to my co-workers, and they agreed it was pretty creepy. Except for my boss, who overheard everything and claimed I was making up stories and trying to gain sympathy for having to take the shift. A week later as I'm working the night shift, we get an order from the same guy again and this is when it finally hits the fan. I arrive at the house at around 10.30pm, and keep in mind that from my perspective on the road, it didn't look like a single light in the house was on. I get out of my car and I walk to the front door with the pizza box in my arms. As I approach the door, it quickly swings open to reveal the man, except this time, he was wearing a suit and I jumped back. He laughs and said, Sorry if I scared you. I saw you out on the window, and I figured if I just opened the door now, so you wouldn't have to ring the bell. I was getting scared because as I mentioned before, there were no lights on in the house. So he was sitting in the dark this whole time, and if so, why? I nervously laugh and say, it's okay. He asked me if I liked his suit, which I said yes. He then asked me, would you like to go on a date with me tonight? I once again tell him I have a boyfriend, to which he chuckles, gets close to me and says, there's no way a girl your age is in a serious relationship. You should really go on a date with me. He grabs the pizza box from me and throws it to the side and grabs me by my arms hard. I'm officially sweating bullets at this point and now trying to cry from the fear that was overwhelming me. I start pleading with him, dude please, I just want to go home, I don't want to go on a date tonight. He just stares at me with the most sinister look I've ever seen on someone's face and says, I don't care, get inside now, we're gonna have a good time. He starts trying to pull me to the house and I'm trying to resist as hard as I can. After a bit of struggling he lets go of one of my arms and starts grabbing something out of his pocket which I presumed was a knife. I did something to this day that I'm still thankful worked as he was doing that. I used my free arm to punch him as hard as I could in the stomach. This stuns me for a few seconds and as he loosened his grip on me, allowed me to break free. I quickly run to my car and as I get in he runs at me and tries pulling me out of the car, holding the knife in the other arm and just starts yelling. I grab a half empty soda bottle I had in the cup holder and throw it and luckily it hits his head and he lets me go. I slam on the door and then all of a sudden he jumps right on the hood of my car and starts scratching and banging on my windshield with his knife. I put the car in reverse and quickly back out of the spot and quickly reverse down the road with him desperately trying to hold on. He's banging on my hood screaming, stop the car. I turn onto the next road as swiftly as possible and luckily, he falls off the hood of my car. I slammed the gas as hard as I could to get away from him as far as I could. In my panicked state, I drove a couple blocks down the street and kept making turn after turn onto other side blocks as I feared I was being followed. Eventually, I reached a red light and I slammed on the brakes and just sat at the intersection frozen 
from what had just happened. I began crying and violently shaking as I was just sitting there. It dawned on me that I came so close to losing my life and I couldn't help but feel like I shouldn't have been alive. Once the light turned green, I pulled over to the side and just sat there crying. Eventually, I get the energy to drive back to the pizzeria and almost immediately after I walk in, my coworker knew something was wrong after seeing me. I practically broke down in front of him and everyone else came to the front wondering what was going on. I fought my tears and explained everything that just happened. My coworker comforted me and my boss surprised me and began apologizing profusely for what had happened and for putting me on the night shift. He took me into the office and handed me the phone to call the cops. They arrived at the store and I gave them my statement, as well as taking pictures of any marks on myself as well as scratches on my car for the encounter as evidence. My coworker followed behind me as I drove home and I collapsed on my bed and strangely enough, I managed to fall asleep. I quit my job the next day and luckily a friend of mine managed to hook me up with a new job at her clothing store. As far as the psycho goes, two days later I received an update from the police. The entire duplex is owned by the guy's brother who lived on the right side with his wife and the psycho lived on the left side of the duplex. I learned that he had been in and out of jail constantly at first for robberies and assaults. He had been released from jail about five months ago apparently. When they arrived at the house, he was long gone and his family had no idea where he ran off to, but the police insisted they would find him. And indeed they did, albeit not alive. I spent the next two months in fear that he would find me and finish what he had in mind, but the police contacted me and updated me on the case. Apparently, he fled to another city nearby and attempted to kidnap a teenager walking alone late at night on the street. Luckily, somebody happened to be looking out the window at the right time, called the cops, and the police caught him by trying to force her into his car. He manages to flee and the police chase after him. He blew a red light near a busy boulevard and a van slammed right into the driver's side of his car. By some sort of miracle, the driver of the van only sustained minor injuries while the psycho succumbed to his wounds long before the ambulance even arrived. I thanked the officers for everything they did and for informing me, so I walked out of the station. I walk down the street and I light up a cigarette as I'm taking in everything that I'd just been told. I don't wish death on people, but after hearing about his death, I felt relieved. I felt relieved that he couldn't hurt anyone anymore. I was relieved that I wouldn't have to ever encounter him again and that I wouldn't have to go through with charging him and reliving what happened that night. Who knows where I'd be if he managed to pull me into his house. I grew up in Ohio in the 70s, and me and my childhood friend Joe were outside all the time when we could manage it. Joe lived on a farm that bordered a pretty big forest, and my parents would drop me off in the morning and we'd stay in the woods all weekend. We'd only come out for school. We loved pretending that we were frontiersmen. We'd build shelters, traps, practice making fire with sticks, the whole nine yards. When we got to be in high school, we got this notion to pull a stand by me. This was based on the movie on the same name that just came out. The idea was that we'd walk the railroad tracks out in the country, but instead of looking for a dead body, we'd find cool bridges to fish from and to camp little ways off the tracks. Of course, we knew this was dangerous and we'd likely be trespassing, but we were kids. We had a lot of fun. We did find beautiful rivers. We discovered bridges no one went to. We fished. We hid from trains. At night, we camped in woods just near the tracks and made small hidden fires. Nothing bad ever happened. It was idyllic. In fact, it was so fun we did it multiple times. Never had a problem. After high school, me and Joe went our own ways. We both left home, but always stayed in touch and always tried to coordinate visits so we would see each other occasionally. Well, one summer in the mid-90s, it worked out that we were both in town for about a week. We would do stuff with family in the day, and at night, we'd either catch drinks at a bar or sit outside Joe's house around a fire and talk about the old days. One night, me and Joe got to talking about our standby me trips. Well, nostalgia and beer are a heck of a mix. Soon, we decided to take a day, walk the rails, camp one night, and walk home. The day came, we started out early morning. We had my wife drop us off in our old spot where we used to start, right outside our hometown. She thought this was absolutely crazy and made sure to mention it. When she pulled away, Joe suggested that instead of walking the usual route, we take the opposite direction, just to be adventurous. We knew the land well, we had a map, and so I gave it a screw it, and off we set. The day went fine. It was fun and a little sad, but in a good way. We found a bridge and sat on the edge, smoked a joint and moved on. We had no fishing gear, but we brought some canned food and other stuff. Before night started to set in, we picked a spot to camp. It was a thick forested area, trees on every side of the train tracks, so you felt like you were in a tunnel. We had brought small hammocks to sleep on, but before we set them up, we decided to do a little scouting of the perimeter. Now, this is what we used to do in the old days too. 
We'd walk the area around a little bit just to make sure some dude's house wasn't just over a hill and we were actually camping in their yard. We walked maybe a hundred or so feet into the woods and up a small incline. We figured if we didn't see anything from up top of the short hill, we'd be fine. But when we got to the top, we saw an old building down at the bottom, about a hundred yards into the woods. It was barely visible. We pondered over what to do. We both assumed it was a sugar shack or something, because there didn't appear to be any clear road into it. From where we were, there didn't look to be anyone in it either. All was quiet. No movement could be seen. No lights. We decided to walk a little closer, just to make sure. We came down the hill very slowly, and as we neared the building, we saw it and it wasn't a sugar shack at all. It was an old church. It looked like it had been abandoned for years. It was a squat, sagging building whose wooden planks were almost black from years of moss and rot. A cross still stood on top of the place, also weathered black. None of the windows had glass, and there were no doors, just open doorways. We got close enough to see inside. There were rows of pews in a built-up section in front for a preacher to stand. We didn't go all the way in. We didn't want to. Beyond all that, there was no sign of anyone else. No footprints, no paths, no roads. It was an abandoned church. We left immediately and went back up the hill to our spot that we had picked to camp. Having a hill between us and the church made us feel better, but we were still a little uneasy. We chalked it up just to the natural creepiness seeing a church in the middle of the woods would elicit. Besides, at this point it was dusk and we just decided to rake up our hammocks and go to sleep and move on at early morning. Night set in, and as we lay in our hammocks and just talked, we began to hear something in the direction of the church. Our conversation about it went a little like this. Do you hear that? What is that? It sounds like people singing. And it did sound just like singing. We both slid right out of our hammocks and hunkered down, straining to hear more. We listened for a minute or two, and the singing continued, but it wasn't getting louder. Finally, we decided to creep back up the hill and see if we could spy where the sound was coming from. We could still move very quietly in the woods from the old days. It was second nature to us. The moon was barely out, but it provided enough light so you wouldn't walk right into a tree, but it was near pitch black. We didn't use flashlights as we crept slowly up the hill, and we didn't talk. When we got to the top, we saw light in the distance. It was coming from the church, and the singing was coming from inside. Joe and I put our heads close together and had a hushed conversation that boiled down to, can you believe this? The light looked to be a candlelight from the way it flickered, and though we tried, we couldn't make out what was being sung. It sounded like church music, but in another language. We sat and watched for a while, trying to see who was in there, but we only saw occasional shadows. We had no intention of getting closer either. We had about a football field length between us, and we aimed to keep it that way. The singing continued for a bit, and then it stopped. After that, a booming male voice began to chant. I was already freaked out, but this voice thoroughly scared the crap out of me. It sounded like some Old Testament preacher you see in movies, but again, it was like he was speaking in a different language because we couldn't understand a single word. Eventually, it got to where the single male voice would say something, and then a bunch of voices would answer in song. This lasted for a while, and then they all broke into this long, sustained wail that just kept getting louder. It got so loud and so disturbing that I covered my ears. Then it stopped. At this point, I was just getting ready to say, let's get the heck out of here, when Joe put a hand on my shoulder and hissed, they're coming out. We were far enough away that we couldn't really make them out very well, but what we could see was a line of figures walk out the open doorway, all holding hands in single file. We could see some of them had flashlights. They began to sing again, and the light from the flashlights began to move toward us and the hill. We booked it back down to our campsite, grabbed our stuff, and ran to the tracks. Once there, we ran down the tracks in the direction we had come from. After a few minutes, we stopped and looked back. We saw lights coming down the hill, and they were moving erratically like whoever was holding them was shaking them. We continued to run in spurts and walk as fast as we could. We eventually stopped seeing the lights and came to a road. By our map, we knew a small town that was about 15 minutes down it, and we walked there, got to a 24-hour gas station, and called my wife to come get us. My wife and other friends all just thought it was kids messing around, but I heard those voices and they sure as hell didn't sound like any kids to me. Not sure who those people were, but it was definitely the most creepiest thing that happened to me out in the woods. So, this happened about five years ago while I was nine months pregnant. I was Christmas shopping at the mall with my then seven and 15 year old daughters one Saturday night in a very safe city with very low crime rate. There was an Applebee's connected to the mall and we ended our shopping pretty late and the mall stores were starting to close. So I took my kids to the connected Applebee's for a late dinner. We finished up eating at about 10 p.m. to leave out the Applebee's entrance into the practically deserted parking lot with shopping bags in tow. 
As we got to the car, I was in the middle of maneuvering the shopping bags in my arms to find my keys. When a 50-ish year old looking guy starts walking up from somewhere in the parking lot with shaggy gray and white hair and a faded flannel shirt and old jeans. I noticed him briskly approaching when he was about 40 feet away and he said, Give me all your money now. My blood ran cold and I stared at him owlishly and shakingly said, What? He then said he was just kidding and came up and stood right next to my daughters, who were standing on the other side of the car, waiting for me to unlock the door to let them in. He then starts making small talk with me and my girls. He's asking things like if they were being good girls for Santa, how old they were, if we got all of our Christmas shopping done, what kind of things did we get, etc. He didn't seem drunk, high, slow, or anything at all. He was very coherent and seemed sound of mind. Mind you, I was a heavily pregnant woman, alone with my two daughters in a mostly deserted parking lot at 10 o'clock at night. I was being approached by a stranger who came and stood right next to my kids on the other side of the car, just shooting the breeze talking to me and my kids with his hands in his pockets and occasionally looking over his shoulder. I didn't want to aggravate him, so I was politely conversing with him and trying to look calm and nonchalant while trying to disguise my frantic hands digging inside of my giant purse for my car keys. This exchange went on for about a couple of minutes while he periodically kept looking over his shoulder. I was silently panicking and trying to politely keep the situation from escalating by calmly and nonchalantly talking to him while also trying to in vain to find my car keys to get us out of there. They were in there hiding good. I felt that at any moment he was going to pull a knife or gun or rob me and my kids were right next to him, away from their mother on the other side of the car and I couldn't find my car keys to get my kids into the safety of the car. He kept trying to engage them in conversation, and I could see that my oldest daughter was a little weirded out. She kept glancing at me to gauge my assessment and reaction to the situation. Being that he was only talking and acting friendly, and I was doing my best to stay calm, they were oblivious to the alarming situation we were all in. And being 9 months pregnant, and that I was no match for this full grown man, especially if he was hiding a weapon on him. While still desperately digging for my keys, I tried to politely give him hints that the conversation was over by saying things like, it was nice chatting with you, but I gotta get these kids to bed, and it was nice meeting you, and telling my girls to say that it was nice meeting him too. My polite attempts to get this guy to leave wasn't working because he kept sidestepping my attempts, and asking them what their favorite school subjects are, and how nice young ladies they were, etc. While I was struggling with the shopping bags and digging in my giant cluttered purse for my car keys, my outgoing 7 year old was completely oblivious to how not okay the situation was because he was being friendly and because of the whole, I'm with mommy, so I'm safe child mentality. So, she started to talk about what she picked out for dad for Christmas, and started enthusiastically talking about kid stuff, and asking him if he knew what Minecraft was, etc, and keeping this creep from leaving us alone, but keeping him engaged in conversation. They didn't realize that I was becoming desperate to get them out of there. Then I suddenly felt this sinking feeling of dread when I realized that I may have lost my car keys, and them all and that we were stuck outside with this strange man who kept looking over his shoulders and was showing no signs of walking away, and I was thinking that he was waiting for the perfect moment to pounce. All he had to do was grab one of my girls and threaten their life, knowing it would make me do whatever he wanted as long as he wouldn't hurt them. I started to feel my adrenaline start to spike, and my heart and stomach started doing flip-flops, and I felt like at any moment something was about to go down, as the gravity of realizing that there were no other people or witnesses around, and that they were totally alone with him at that moment, the odds were stacked against us, and that he has his chance. He all of a sudden was all like, okay, it was nice talking to you, see you later, and walked off in the same direction as which he came. It wasn't until then, I found my car keys and locked the car and told my kids to get in fast and I got in too and locked the doors and started the car and drove out of there. My 15 year old lightheartedly and jokingly said, okay, that was weird, and laughed. I was overwhelmed with relief and then I was confused over what just happened. I thought to myself, why the heck would a guy of seemingly sound mind think it was totally acceptable to go out of his way just to approach a woman and her kids in a deserted parking lot late at night just to chit chat? But being that nothing bad happened, I brushed it off and joked about it too. When we got home, my husband greeted us and asked us how shopping went, and I said it went well, and my 15 year old told him what happened in the parking lot and how weird it was and was kinda joking about it. I started joking too saying how I was mentally having a panic attack while trying to look calm and I started making fun of myself by telling my husband how I was attempting to inconspicuously rummage through my purse to find my car keys. My husband went completely white and I acknowledged his horrified look of alarm and I assured him that albeit creepy, the guy was talking and eventually left on his own. Now, my father-in-law is a retired sheriff deputy and my husband went through police academy training after graduating high school. He decided to go to business school instead of becoming a cop. 
and being that the knowledge he gained from that, plus growing up with a cop from my dad, I found out why my husband looked absolutely horrified when I told him about the details. What my husband told me completely rattled me to the bone. My husband told me that he was 100% sure the reason why that guy was hanging around us and chit-chatting was because he was waiting for me to unlock my car. And the reason why he was standing next to our kids was because once I unlocked the car and the kids started to get inside, he was most likely going to force himself into the car with the kids and hold a knife or gun to them to gain leverage on me to force me to cooperate, knowing that I wouldn't abandon my kids which would force me to get into the car with them and then do whatever he wanted me to do, which most likely would be to drive to a remote location to do whatever knows what. And being that he wasn't wearing a mask, suggests that his intentions were to also leave no witnesses to identify him. I then remembered that he was positioned by the backseat passenger door where my 7 year old was, standing by waiting to get in. My husband then told me that the most likely reason why the guy ended up leaving was because it took so long for me to find my keys and the longer it took, the more anxious and spooked it made him. And that whole time, me trying to search for my car keys in my purse saved me from potentially being abducted. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I recently discovered this sub and immediately thought of this experience that happened to me two summers ago while I was cat sitting and house sitting for an older couple I met in a French class I was taking. This couple lived near a busy corner with a bookshop, coffee shop, a grocery store, and a movie theater in a nice neighborhood of a big city. For all these reasons and more, I was pretty excited to house sit there. My own apartment, where I lived with my boyfriend and my own cat, was about a 10 minute drive to 40 minute walk further up the street in a quiet, residential area with nothing much around it. Now, my own cat is vocal and super social. Because of this, we try never to leave him alone at night because he will literally cry for us all night. We're always slightly paranoid that he's going to get us evicted due to noise complaints from neighbors. We lived on the top floor and you could literally hear him crying from the bottom floor and outside if the door to the building is open. So my boyfriend and I decided that he should stay at the apartment with our cat while I was house sitting. My boyfriend drops me off at the house and I settle in with my luggage. Look around the surprisingly large three story house and then decide to walk over to the grocery store to pick up some food for the next few days. As I'm walking home with my bag of groceries, I notice this man, extremely tall and gaunt, with a head full of long, shaggy hair, walking parallel across the street watching me. I'm only about two houses away from the place where I'm staying, so I sit down on the edge of the wall as though I'm taking a break and call my mom, trying to keep an eye on him surreptitiously from the corner of my eye. This man stops behind a pole across the street and continues to watch me. I tell my mom this guy seems to think that a pole hides him from my view, but that I can see him from there, standing still as a statue, just watching me. I don't want him to know where I'm staying, so we continue chatting and eventually, I turn my full gaze on the man to let him know that I see him watching me. For a moment he doesn't react at all, then he just sort of meanders on down the small street and I watch him turn the corner and disappear from my view. I tell my mom and gather my groceries and walk cautiously down the street, keeping an eye out for him as I near the place I'm house sitting and don't see him. I dart in through the back door next to the garage as quickly as I can and breathe a sigh of relief once I'm inside. I tell my mom everything's good and I put away the groceries and forget about the entire incident. The couple has a beautiful library, so I continually spend the rest of the afternoon and well into the evening just perusing their walls of books and selecting a few to bring upstairs to the guest bedroom on the third floor. I'm playing some music and just enjoying the quiet downtime all to myself. I finally get sleepy, text my boyfriend goodnight, and fall asleep. I wake up shortly thereafter after a terrifyingly realistic dream that this gaunt man has walked into the room, trailing his fingertips along my body. The room is dark, all the window blinds shut, and my body goes completely still. Half positive that it wasn't a dream, and that he had somehow broken in, it was waiting in the shadow. I quietly reach underneath my pillowcase for my phone, I always keep my phone tucked under my pillow, and it's not there. My panic rises, and my mind overreacts. He's here and he's playing a game with me. He took my phone. He's somewhere in the house. I desperately begin to pat around my bed as quietly as possible, searching beneath the other pillow for my phone. Not there. I think, surely he'll hear me if I get out of my bed to look. But I suddenly remember that I left my laptop next to me on the bed and I open it, quickly sending text after text to my boyfriend through iMessage until he wakes up. I tell him I can't find my phone, had a bad dream, and I'm super anxious. With him awake and responding, I get the courage to flip on the lamp and get out of bed. I search around the floor, thinking my phone must have fallen while I was sleeping. Nope, not on the floor. Finally, as I search the bed frantically, 
I find it atop the covers on the other side of the bed. Weird, but I suppose I must have knocked it across the bed or something. I don't sleep well the rest of the night, hearing noises from across the three floors of the creaky stairs and house, thinking anyone could break in through the patio door across from my room. All they'd have to do is get to the balcony and wake up the next morning exhausted. The next day, I'm sitting in the living room at their piano practicing. I'm an opera singer, and I was mostly excited about this house sitting because I'd get the chance to sing without worrying about apartment neighbors complaining, with the blinds open. There are some kids riding their bikes, neighbors with dogs, the usual. I'm enjoying my afternoon when I notice there's an odd, run-down, dilapidated, dark house nearly diagonal to this one which doesn't fit in at all with the otherwise nice neighborhood. Gaunt man walks out of it and sits on the porch. My stomach drops. I call my boyfriend and tell him that the creepy guy apparently lives across the street. I shut the blinds facing that way so that he can't see me and retreat to the other side of the house with the kitchen. I spend the rest of the day chilling, convincing myself that I'm overreacting, that everything is fine and I don't need to worry. Nonetheless, come nightfall, the house seems just way too large with too many entrances and the bottom floor is so far away that I worry the noise wouldn't carry up to the top floor if someone did break in. Naturally, I cannot sleep at all. I end up retrieving a knife from the kitchen and stashing it under my pillow. Noises keep me up. Creaks, odd sounds. Around 11pm, I call my boyfriend and beg him to come stay with me, assuring him that our cat could survive one night without us. He drives over and pulls into the garage. I come unlock the hall door from the garage to let him inside. I still don't sleep well, but at least I get some sleep with him here, feeling a little safer. He gets a little weirded out about the knife under the pillow and tells me to put it back where I got it. I stash it in the bedside drawer, just in case. The next day, I pull it together and tell him he doesn't need to stay. I'm clearly overreacting. Then comes nightfall and the prolifera of odd noises. I decide I can't stay in the guest room at the top floor anymore because I feel like I can't hear anything. I go down to the second floor and try to sleep on the couch in their media room. George of the Jungle is on TV, and I try to fall asleep while watching that. Instead, I get more and more paranoid that I won't be able to hear anything over the movie and end up switching the movie off. I try to fall asleep again. Now I'm sure that I can hear noises from both above and below me. Not the cat who, every night, hid in a tote bag in their bedroom on the second floor and never made a sound except to hiss at me when we crossed each other's paths. I get no sleep patrolling the entire house all night, finally falling asleep as the night sky tinged gray with dawn. The next day was my birthday, and his little sister was flying up from across the country to spend a week with us. He couldn't stay the night with me anymore because she was still quite young and needed adult supervision, and I insisted that she stay at our place rather than have them come to the house I was at. Fortunately, my best friend had just returned from her trip, and we decided to have a birthday sleepover. I feel a little paranoid, but again, I'm able to get some sleep with someone else there and wake up a little more refreshed. She leaves and I sit in the kitchen, which faces the street where Gaunt Man first saw me. Gaunt Man is across the street, walking and watching. I duck down against the wall below the window, placing my phone at the gap between the blinds with only the top of my head showing. Gaunt Man gets closer, still watching as I hit record on the video. I get several seconds of him watching the house until he suddenly seems to notice the top of my head or the phone and snaps his own gaze back to the sidewalk below him and walks on. My heart is pounding. Now he knows that I've watched him watching me again. Probably saw the phone recording or taking a photo and he lives right across the street, where he often sat on his porch for hours smoking with a couple of other men, facing my direction. The next few nights were a blur of me wandering around the house, checking closets and other closed spaces upon returning from going out, placing chairs against entrances so that I'd hear them scrape if they got moved, half sleeping in the media room, double checking windows, exhausted until the couple of hours of sleep I would get when the sky would tinge gray and I'd felt I'd survive the most dangerous part of the night. My best friend found out I wasn't sleeping at all, and offered to stay with me for the last night. Boyfriend's little sister was still there so he couldn't. I accepted her offer, feeling foolish and overdramatic, but thankful. We stayed back in the guest room on the top floor, watching Parks and Rec quietly with the subtitles on, so that I could still hear the rest of the house. It was around 1am or so when a shrill, piercing siren suddenly echoed throughout the house. My best friend and I sat up in bed, paralyzed for a moment with fear and confusion. Did they say anything about an alarm? She asked me. No, I responded, hesitantly wondering if I had missed something in the notes they had left. We stared at each other for another long moment. What should we do? She asked. I don't know, I said. We should shut the door and lock it, right? She was the closest to the door. She shut it quickly and locked it. I moved the nightstand in front of it, a pathetic barricade. The siren continued to wail throughout the house. Should we call the police? I asked, my heart pounding into my mouth, opening the blinds with my hands and trying to peer through the dark street below. 
There was a window to the bathroom with the access from the balcony patio. I checked it, just to make sure yet again that it was shut and locked. We should probably call the police. Or should we? She had already begun to call the police, telling them that we were house-sitting and an alarm had just gone off. We were concerned about a man who had been watching me over the past few days and we were alone in the house. The police got our address and said that they would arrive soon. Suddenly, the alarm stopped. With the alarm off, we gathered the courage to remove the nightstand from the door and unlock it. I had Pepper Mace gripped tightly in my hand as we swung the door open, ready to confront whatever was out there. Nothing. No one. I checked the giant glass door a few steps away that led to the balcony patio. Locked. We made our way down the stairs, cautious, quiet. We finally made it down to the bottom floor when there was pounding at the front door. I hurriedly made it over to the door, removing the chair I had placed in front of it as quickly as I could, letting in two policemen. They identified themselves to the door. They came inside, asked me a few questions about this man, and then decided it was probably just a harmless homeless man. I didn't tell them that he lived across the street because I thought they'd accuse me of overreacting. Quote unquote, he was just walking home, not following you or watching you. End quote. They couldn't find a security system and told us that it was the fire alarm that had gone off, but they couldn't figure out why. After checking the house and finding no one, they left. I emailed the owners the next day to tell them what happened and that we had called the police to come check it out. They apologized that it happened and thought it was strange. I left the next day and politely declined house sitting for them when they asked again a few months later. We moved out of the city and across the country last summer. My boyfriend only recently told me that he and my dad, who had come up to help us move, had seen Gauntman walking across the street from our apartment and that last week before we moved. So Gauntman, even if you weren't stalking and watching me, let's not ever meet again. A couple years ago, one of my closest friends relocated cross country with his long term girlfriend to a work job he couldn't refuse. Only issue he had was that he did not want to fly his dogs out with them when they made the move since they'd be staying in a hotel for the first month. He was also a bit reticent to fly them out due to health concerns for both pets. By the time he located a home to rent, he was missing his dogs and made the request of his sister, another close friend, and myself to drive them to him in LA. Now we're Chicago folks, so the trip would be a long one, however. With the three of us to foot the near 30 hour drive, it would be a piece of cake. We left early and drove long hours. Along the way, it was decided between my friend and I that if we'd foot the majority of the drive ourselves, and if we needed to, we'd let our friend's sister do some driving. We were on a bit of a time crunch due to a snafu with the rental agreement, so we didn't have the luxury to stop very often past an 8 hour stay at a Denver LA Quinta Inn. As for the journey itself, it was relatively smooth, bearing getting pulled over right before entering Utah for driving for 2 miles in the left lane of an empty highway. Whoops. From that point, we made it through Utah, Arizona in Nevada without much trouble until we entered California in need of gas. I had been driving for the majority of the first day and tagged my buddy in after being pulled over. I remained in the shotgun seat as navigator, searching through the GPS for a fuel stop. We kept our eyes peeled for road signs and discovered a sign pointing to Yermo Ghost Town or something along those lines, which had a mobile station. How wonderful. It was convenient too, as it was located almost directly off of the interstate. We rolled in on a little more than fumes when we approached the pumps. Normally, we let the dogs out at every rest stop, but having stopped not long before then, and with both dogs sleeping snugly in the back, I decided to pump gas without anyone else leaving the vehicle. My buddy pulled us up on the opposite side of a beat-up green sedan with a short, plump gentleman who just turned in to approach the shop. I noticed a few other hoopties at the pumps, all unoccupied, and there were a couple of other cars parked up near the station, most likely belonging to the employees, so nothing seemed out of the ordinary until I swiped my credit card. The pump rejected my first swipe attempt, which I talked up to a misread. I swiped again and the pump reads out, please see attendant. I was annoyed but we needed gas. I tapped on the window and told my buddy what I was doing and asked if anyone needed anything. After taking their orders for Gatorade and Marlboro Reds, I walked up to the store and made a mental note of how strange this gas station was. Kinda quiet, especially for one right off the interstate, but that's no matter. As I walked in though, more weirdness. First thing I noticed is that there are some boxes of chips just left on the floor, like someone was stocking shelves and just quit. As I veered to my right, I noticed that immediately there is no one milling about in this place. With the six cars beside my own out there, I felt like I would see someone. Things got even weirder when I realized that there was no one behind the counter, no customers or workers, and then it dawned on me. What had happened to the gentleman who was at the pump adjacent to mine? Surely they can't all be in the bathroom. This is where I began to feel this gnawing cessation in my stomach. Something isn't right. I have always been a person who felt like I could trust my instincts, 
and those instincts were screaming at me just to get out of there. I want to run, but I hold back. I would look suspicious booking it out of a gas station that was empty and decide to just play it cool. Natural. Don't let your body language let on to how badly you're freaking out in your head. I was probably inside of this gas station for only a couple minutes when I left, but I stopped just before exiting to listen for something. Anything. A flushing toilet would have been a good sound, but nothing. As I exit the shop and see my car, I begin to feel dread. It's like that moment in a movie where the hero is about to make it to the end of their trial, but the celebratory fanfare disappears, and in that silence, something comes and strikes them down. I am about 25 yards from the car when I see this gentleman come out from around the side of the shop opposite of me. This is not the same man as I saw while pumping gas. He was larger and had a peculiar look on his face. The best way I could describe it, it was like Nick Cage's smile from Face Off before the titular act had occurred. I continued walking towards my car, but when I turned back to look at him, he was now walking towards me with a purpose. At this point, I noped my way back to the car with increased urgency in my step. And of course, my friend has the door to the car locked like a complete douche clown. There is also the 95 pound golden retriever sitting in my seat. Apparently my travel companions did not notice how freaked out I was, or the creepy gentleman still walking in my direction. I punched the window and told him to unlock the door, to which he only half rolls down the window to tell me the dog was in my seat and they were afraid she'd jump out when I opened the door. I reached my hand in and threw the dog towards the back seat as hard as I could while my friend is just now realizing how freaked out I am. He started the car and drove off quickly. I took one last look back and saw the guy had stopped about a pump away from where we were, still with that same look on his face. We found another gas station further down the road, this time with a ton of people inside and out. After thoroughly creeping out my friends with the story as I pumped gas, we made our way back to the interstate, which meant passing that gas station again. It's been about 15 minutes since we pulled out initially, and we go silent as we notice that those very same cars are still sitting in the same spots where we had left them. After thoroughly freaking out for a few miles, I received a phone call from my credit card company about a $100 charge at a mobile station. The lady on the phone was really helpful in fixing the situation for me and was as entirely creeped out by the situation as we were. In the end, we made it to LA and had a great vacation, but it still bothers me as to what was going on at this little gas station off the highway and what was that smiley man story. So, crazy smiley man and whoever else was lying in wait at the Yermo Ghost Town exit mobile station, let's not meet. I lived in New Mexico for several years before moving to the Midwest. My friend, Amy, and I, both females, would spend many days exploring the remote corners of the New Mexico, discovering abandoned ghost towns and enjoying the quiet, desolate beauty of the desert. One afternoon in March 2010, we were traveling from Ruidoso to Albuquerque. Always up for exploring, we took a back road rather than traveling the more direct highway. One leg of our journey had us on NM55. It's a remote, teeny tiny two-lane highway. We loved those types of roads, up until that day. This part of New Mexico's flat and desolate desert, you can see for miles, and there's virtually nothing except dirt and rock between towns, and towns can be miles apart. So we were on NM55 going north. After a few minutes, we saw a white pickup truck up ahead of us, going the same direction. Suddenly, he stopped his truck sideways in the middle of the highway, blocking both lanes. We were about a mile away from him and as we got closer, we began to get uneasy. We could see no reason for him to do this. We were the only other vehicle out there and we began wondering if we should turn around rather than come up to him and have to stop. We were about a half a mile away from him when he pulled over to the opposite side of the highway but his truck was still pointed the direction we were going. We tried to relax a little. Surely, this guy was a rancher or something. Maybe he was checking something on his land. As we passed him, we noticed a few things. One, there was only one person in the truck, a middle-aged guy who never took his eyes off us, and two, he was talking into a walkie-talkie. A few seconds after we passed him, he pulled back onto the highway and started following us, but he never got too close. He would get to within a few car lengths and then drop back a little and then speed back up again to within a few car lengths. We were getting nervous. We realized how alone we really were. We had seen no other traffic on that road and we hadn't told anyone about our great idea to take this detour. We checked our cell phones and neither one had signal. Typical for remote New Mexico, but scary given our present situation. Amy was driving and speeding up while I frantically checked the map, hoping to find a road that would have more traffic. There was no other road. We had to travel this one to get to the next town, mountain air. Turning around to go back the other way didn't seem like a good option. After a few minutes, we saw another pickup truck coming towards us. He was going very, very slowly, maybe 20 miles per hour. 
if that. This pickup was old and beat up, whereas the one that was behind us was newer. Amy had us up to 75 miles per hour, which wasn't typical for us on these 55 mile per hour highways, and we blew by the old pickup. As we passed it, we saw that it was another middle-aged guy, and he was talking into a walkie-talkie. After the white pickup passed him, he pulled a U-turn and pulled in behind it. As we watched all of this, we could see the white pickup truck guy talking into his walkie-talkie. No doubt these two knew each other. We were being deliberately followed, and for the first and only time in my life, I felt hunted. They stayed right behind us. We watched for obstacles in the road. We truly thought old beat up pickup guy had set up a trap in the road and our vehicle would be disabled somehow. We talked about driving into the fields, we were in an SUV, but this was obviously their territory and we were afraid of what would happen if we went off road and got cornered. So we stayed on the highway. By now, white pickup truck guy was right on top of us. We could see him talking into the walkie talkie and he stayed right on our bumper. And old beat up pickup truck guy was right on top of him. The three of us sped down the highway. The white pickup inched closer. His maneuvering and edging closer made it apparent that he was trying to bump us. I watched helplessly as he got to within inches of our back bumper. Amy floored it. We were passing 80 miles per hour and edging up to 90. The road was flat and deserted, but any little thing going wrong would have been catastrophic. We absolutely were not going to slow down or stop if we could help it. The white pickup pulled into the opposite lane and started to gain speed. The only thing we could think of was that he wanted to pass us and get in front of us. If he got in front of us and his buddy was behind us, then we'd be boxed in and trapped. We looked frantically at the rocky desert on both sides of us. Our only option was to off-road it. As we topped a small incline, we saw a sign that said Salinas Pueblo Missions National Monument, and it pointed towards a road on the left. And right at that moment, a blue pickup truck pulled out of the road and onto the highway in front of us. As we came up on the blue pickup, we saw the plate said US Park Service. We looked at each other and then looked behind us. Both pickup trucks did U-turns and went the other way. We followed the blue pickup to Mountain Air and then made our way to Albuquerque. I don't know exactly what those guys' intentions were, but they weren't good. There is something seriously wrong out there. I notified the state police and they said they would keep an eye on things. So let's not ever meet, or have anyone else ever meet, these guys. This story occurred roughly 14 years ago, when I was 12 years old and living in east side of an Australian rainforest. When I say rainforest, our house was on a 40 acre property surrounded by bush. The house itself was owned by a Swiss man named Hans. Occasionally, he would come down with his tractor and slash the long grass surrounding our house so we could access slightly more of the property in the summer. We lived about a 40 minute drive from the small town center. This meant that if we needed groceries, medical attention, or to contact our parents, say while we were at school, it would be a 40 minute drive before anything could be done. The house sat on the side of a large mountain, roughly three fourths of the way up so naturally most of the land we called home was strewn with valleys, nooks and hideaways. We had trails we could walk and they led to a stream and a small waterfall. It was a truly beautiful place but considerably scary to me and my small siblings, one brother and one sister slightly younger than me. We knew our neighbors on both sides of the property. But because of the location of our house was pretty remote, our nearest neighbors were roughly a 10 minute drive away. One was a lovely old lady who used to wave to us when we got off the school bus before we made the trek to our house every day. I think our parents asked for her to keep an eye on us. The other was a middle aged man and his family. He was a real jerk who excavated around the bottom border where our properties met and continuously interrupted the stream and waterfall's clear flowing water supply. Lots of strange and creepy stuff happens when you're living in the middle of nowhere but one in particular involved a guy I certainly don't want to meet again. Being pretty removed from people, it was extremely rare that we ever got visitors we didn't know were coming. When people we didn't recognize turned up, it was usually because they were lost and needed directions. One day though, a man in a car came roaring down our driveway. I remember running inside to tell my dad someone weird was here. He immediately walked outside to see who this unwanted guest was. My dad goes outside to see what all the commotion is about while my mom keeps us inside being protective. The man has a large red fur dog in the back of his car that looks like a German Shepherd cross. It snarled at my dad but immediately cowered when this stranger told it to shut up. Our own dog named Millie was snarling and going ballistic while speed chained up to the house. Hi, my name is John. The way the man spoke was like he was a salesman, a really slick and smooth guy who on the outside seemed friendly but with the overtone of wanting something. My dad immediately responded with, So what are you doing out here then, John? The man was taken aback, obviously not used to dealing with someone as hostile as my dad. They then talked for a while and I could hear my dad talking with a sense of confusion about whatever this man had to say. 
I did however overhear my dad say, what are you thinking, just call the cops. I found out later that the lovely old lady next to us had died. Apparently John was on the other side of her property and went to visit and found her dead. He also asked my dad if they should move the body to make it easier for police to investigate. This is obviously why my dad was telling the man to call the police immediately. Anyway, later that night the police showed up to take a statement from my dad and John, who was hanging around our house until the police arrived. I remember my dad pulling an officer aside and explaining that John wanted to move the body when he first arrived. The police left without any more questions as it looked like she had died from natural causes. John was still at our house. I found him to be a very unsettling person. The way he smiled, the dark of his eyes. He was unfamiliar, but acting like he was one of us. I remember it was a school night and I was trying to watch TV and he was playing songs on his guitar with my mom and my dad at the table. I was angry because he was ruining my shows and I told my mom I wanted him to go and I thought he was weird. She smiled and told me she felt the same and told me I should go to bed. The next day things seemed normal. Went to school, came home. Not seeing the familiar friendly face of the old woman stung a bit on my way past her house. It felt strange and I hoped that she knew her family loved her before she passed. I was a bit sad on the walk home. Until halfway down the driveway, I noticed John's car again and parked out the front of our house. I walked closer and was greeted by his dog, Rusty. He walked outside with my dad and I heard him call Rusty to his car as he was leaving. Apparently he was borrowing tools from my dad. He left and waved goodbye like he was someone that I was going to miss. Again, that sense of overfamiliarity made me feel uncomfortable. I didn't know this man. I didn't like this man and I was hoping he would never come down to our driveway again. My dad then pulled me aside and asked me what I thought of John. I labeled him a weirdo and told my dad I was hoping he wouldn't come back. For the second night in a row, when John returned dad's tools, he was sitting in our house playing guitar and annoying everyone. My mom and my dad were visibly unimpressed by the situation. I heard my mom and dad argue about him hanging around until eventually my dad told him he needed to leave as it was time for us to go to bed. He insisted it was early and tried to make an excuse to stay. I found that very odd. I was polite enough to know when someone didn't want me around so why didn't this man? Or if he did know, why wouldn't he leave? After ushering him out, my mom and my dad had a big talk in their room and my dad told us all that he didn't like John and that he was going to ask him not to come over anymore and if we saw John again, immediately to tell him. The next day was a Saturday so we were going to blow up our cheap inflatable pool and go for a swim as it was getting pretty warm. Around 11am, the sound of a car thundering down the driveway alerts me and I go outside. I run back inside to tell my dad that John is back. Just like the first time I ever laid eyes on John, my dad goes outside and we stay inside with my mom, watching and listening through a screen door. John again with his weird, overfamiliar smile and dark eyes greets my dad and is met with, Look, I don't know who you are, but I don't want you coming around here anymore. You scare my kids and my wife and I don't want you to come back, you understand? I didn't hear John's reply from his tone, but it sounded like he was confused and tried to reason with my dad. My dad wasn't having it and told him to go or he would call the cops. As he was leaving, my dad said, don't come back or you'll be sorry. This is where things truly get weird. As my dad lays this subtle threat on the man, his face completely changes one of rage. He glares at us in the house, sticks up his finger and speeds out of the driveway shouting profanities and churning up gravel, spraying it towards our house. My dad came back and told us we wouldn't be seeing John anymore, and if we did, we were going to call the police. I was relieved. This odd man made me feel uncomfortable in my own home, and the way he reacted when he left confirmed the feeling I got from him when I first saw him. I can't remember if it was the Sunday or the Monday after that day, but John did come back. He tried to reason with my dad and say sorry for whatever caused us to not like him. Before he even got out of his car, my dad said, if you don't turn around and leave, I'm going to smash your face in. He did just that. My dad then called the police to inform them of what happened. Apparently they were going to go and talk to John. I didn't hear any more of what happened to that conversation. A few weeks went by with no sightings or happening with John and we all felt like things were back to normal. This was until our mailbox had been tipped out of the ground and smashed, or possibly run over. I remember asking my dad what happened but he wasn't about to give me any ideas. He later told me that he knew it was John after the way their last conversation ended. The next weekend after the mailbox incident, we went into town to get groceries and a fast food dinner as a bit of a treat, and when we came home down the driveway, my dad immediately stopped my mom from proceeding and said that something was wrong. Next to the carport where we parked our car, at the back of the house, there was a window that opened to the bathroom. My dad must have spotted the window was missing. As we drove down, he got increasingly more tense until we all noticed the window was missing. 
I remember being confused in the back seat and not really knowing what was going on until I saw it. A man, dark eyes and over familiar coming from the window that led to the shower. My dad was exploding with rage and he told my mom to rush down the driveway. The man proceeded to escape the window and run down the back of our property into thick shrubbery. My dad only being on one leg, let Millie loose as she was going ballistic tied up to the house. She raced down the grass engulfed hill into the darkness. She came back with nothing. My dad went out with his flashlight and couldn't find anything either. I'm not sure if anyone slept that night. None of our possessions have been stolen or even moved. We must have caught this man just as he was entering our house. The police came the next day and searched for fingerprints with no avail. My father was furious and again alerted them to John and his strange behavior. They told us they would look into it once again. That was the last time we heard from John that year. I had almost completely forgotten about him and had the summer off to enjoy myself and get ready for high school. The school I went to was pretty large considering where we were but everyone seemed to know each other pretty well, including the teaching staff. Within my first week at the school, we were introduced to all the teachers and teacher aides. I was caught completely unaware when that overfamiliar, dark-eyed man from the previous year was introduced as a teacher aide. Except instead of John, he was introduced as Gregory something. I went into a little bit of a spin as I was trying to make sense of all of it. I was 100% sure that this man named Greg something was the same man who had introduced himself to my family as John. At that moment, so many things rushed into my head. What if he killed the old lady? What if he didn't live close by? What if he wanted to move the body so he could frame my dad? If he lied about something as critical as his name, what else was he lying about? What if police never even made contact with him? I was sitting there for a good 10 minutes trying to piece it together until the teacher called my name to bring me back to reality. That is when he noticed me. The look on his face when he saw mine was one I'll never forget. He immediately recognized me. He looked shocked. His eyes were wide and he said nothing, just staring at me. I could sense that he was now the one feeling uncomfortable and on edge. Later that day, I rushed home to tell my dad who I had found. He was shocked and repeatedly asked if I was sure. He went to the school the next day and discovered the man had put in for an indefinite leave yesterday and may not return. When we learned of the news, my dad told me to watch out and let him know should John or Greg ever return. So John, Greg, whoever you are, let's not ever meet again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. When I was 14, I was asked to babysit my three younger cousins, aged 8, 4, and 1, in an extremely rural mountainous part of Pennsylvania. My aunt and uncle had a wedding to go over to about an hour away and wouldn't be back until very late. Their house was situated on a steep mountainside. Their back deck had a 15 foot drop onto a rocky hill below leading down to a river. Their closest neighbors were about a half a mile away. The closest main road was a mile away, and at night, there were no lights to be seen anywhere around them. Basically, it was in the middle of nowhere and you would have to know where you're going to get there. You don't just accidentally end up there. My aunt and uncle left us with some pizza and their cell phone number next to their landline. This was the early 2000s and I didn't have a cell phone, but even if I did, I wouldn't get reception there anyway, and headed out. The baby was already asleep. The four-year-old wasn't feeling well and was quietly watching TV in the living room as he dozed off, and the eight-year-old was playing guitar here with me up on the loft. The loft overlooked the living room to the left, where I could keep an eye on the four-year-old and there was a huge window that overlooked the driveway to the right. The description of the driveway is an important detail to the story. The road that led to their house ran straight into their forked driveway. It was a dead-end road. The house was as far as you could go. Go to the left driveway. There is a large open carport and that's where my aunt and uncle and anyone who ever visited parked. The right driveway led down a very short but very steep hill to a large leveled out area ended against the garage door that opened to the basement of the house. It was never used as a garage, but served as my uncle's man cave, and where he spent most of his time. Right beside the garage door, a normal door with a window so you could see right in. But this driveway was exclusively used by the kids as a play area because it was the only flat, yard-like area on the property. And being on a mountainside, there isn't much room to safely play otherwise. No cars ever drove down there. Ever. There are too many toys and bikes in the way, and friends and family knew this. It was about 10 p.m., pitch black outside, no moon to illuminate the area either. My cousin and I were still playing Guitar Hero when headlights caught the corner of my eye, and now my aunt's minivan headlights. Huge truck headlights with those roof lights you often see on jeeps or other off-road trucks. Not only that, the truck was going down the right driveway, the kids' play area. This was not my aunt and uncle. This was not anyone they knew. Panic and dread filled my body. 
I was a small teenage girl alone in an isolated house on a mountain at night with three children in my care. In a terrified voice, I asked my cousin, Who is that, Jake? Do you know whose truck that is? And then he looked panicked. No, i never seen that truck before, he replied. I quickly ushered him downstairs, still unsure what to do, but the two little ones were sleeping down there and I wanted to make sure they were safe. I checked on the baby and then grabbed the phone to call 911, and then I started to hear the metal garage door being shaken violently. No one ever opened that garage door. More panic fills me. I hear them try the door beside it, the metal door knob jiggling. No one was actually knocking. It's not like they were checking to see if my uncle was down there. Plus, the lights were out. It was dark down there. They knew no one was down there. They were definitely breaking in. The door leading to the basement steps was right next to the phone, so I could clearly hear all this going on. I quickly turned the little lock on the doorknob just in case they did make it into the basement. My heart was practically jumping out of my chest. I'm talking to the 911 dispatcher as my 8 year old cousin clings to my arm. The operator is calm and trying to call me, but I knew it would be at least 30 minutes until a police officer could get up there, assuming they didn't get totally lost on this mountainside in the pitch dark. I just kept thinking, we are dead, this is how I die. The operator asked for the number my aunt and uncle left me so she could have another dispatcher call them to let them know the situation. I turn around to grab the paper with the number on it and to my absolute horror, I see a man peering in a large sliding glass door. A huge, burly, but what had to been a 6 foot 4 man with long scraggly red hair and a big red bushy beard. And what made it worse, he was grinning at me. Grinning in a way that still scares me to this day. Meanwhile, I had to have looked like a terrified deer in the headlights. I was shaking so hard I could barely hold the phone. There was a second man behind him I couldn't see as well. I have no idea what he looked like, but he was equally as tall but a bit more lanky than the larger man at the sliding glass door. I screamed, oh god they're here, and before the 911 operator could say anything, my 8 year old cousin goes, Mr. Jim? His voice was very confused. It wasn't like my cousin was happy or even relieved to see him. I asked, do you know who that is? But before my cousin could answer, I turned my attention to the man in the door. I'm on the phone with the police, I shouted. I'm grateful he didn't try that door, because I do not think it was locked. The man stared at me hard for a moment, eyebrows furrowed, like deciding what he wanted to do next. But he then just backed away into the darkness. What seemed like an eternity later, I saw the truck lights back up out of the driveway and then back down the road until they disappeared. I was still really scared, and so was my cousin. He had only met that guy a few times, an acquaintance of his dad. It wasn't like it was a close family friend, and obviously, because again, he went down the wrong driveway. Visitors never go down that way. The 911 operator asked for a description of the man, then told me they'd gotten in touch with my aunt and uncle and they were on their way home. She stayed on the phone with me until the police officer showed up a bit later to make sure that the men were gone and they stayed with us until my aunt and uncle got home so they could ask them some questions. My uncle was furious, not at me for calling them home early but at this Mr. Jim guy. My aunt was mad at my uncle and told him to tell Jim to never come back. I didn't know at the time, but my uncle had a drug problem. I don't know what Mr. Jim or his accomplice were doing, or what they would have done if I wasn't on the phone with the police, but that grin was not a friendly one. It was sinister. And again, he also had to have known my uncle was not there, because the basement was dark. He would have seen through the windowed basement door. He had also tried lifting the garage door, something not even my uncle did. He intended to break into the basement. That much is clear to me. There's no other explanation. I never did babysit for them again, and I don't think I ever even went back up there because not long after, my aunt divorced my uncle and moved out. So Mr. Jim, the grinning mountain man who tried to break into the house where I was babysitting, let's not meet again. A few years back, my girlfriend and I, having hiked several other parts of the Appalachian Trail, decided we wanted to give the southern portion of Virginia's trail a shot. It is about 166 miles long, it runs through George Washington and Jefferson National Forest from Roanoke County to Parisburg and Gills County. This is definitely one of the more remote and less traveled parts of the trail, which is exactly what we were looking for. We gathered our gear and made our way to the start of the Virginia Creeper Trail to begin our journey. We had planned our journey to end at Damascus and figured that by the time we got there, we would be more than ready to get home to our own beds. It was early October and the changing of the leaves and colors were amazing. The air was crisp and cool. Perfect hiking weather with beautiful scenery. The majority of the trip was pretty uneventful, just your typical hike. But our last couple of nights is where things got weird. On this portion of the trail, you are supposed to camp on the trail or a designated shelter. We didn't really want to run into other people and didn't want anyone coming up on us in the middle of the night. We decided to ignore those suggestions and find our own little spot off the trail. 
A little searching around and we found a spot a little ways off a trail in the middle of a small clearing. It was perfect. We set up camp, cooked some food, talked for a while, then snuggled up and went to sleep for the night. Somewhere around 2am, I was awoke by my girlfriend shaking me awake telling me, get your gun, someone is outside walking around our tent. She informed me that she woke up to what sounded like someone right outside the tent, running a knife or something along the side while circling us. When hiking, I carry a 1911 with me. You never know exactly who or what you might run into when on such a long hike in a remote location. I got the 1911 out of my pack and then we sat silently, listening for any sounds. A few minutes of nothing but the breeze blowing through the trees and then I heard branches snapping. It sounded like it was a bipedal, based on the way the steps were paced. I turned on the flashlight and flooded the area with light. I thought I saw someone move behind a tree. I yelled out and told them to go away and that I was armed. I kept the light on the area with my gun drawn and slowly approached towards the area where I thought I saw the figure. Then, from my right, I hear what sounds like someone running away through the woods. I spin and face my light that way, and then from the original spot, hear who or whatever was there take off into the woods. There's no way I'm giving chase, so I return to the campsite. I tell my girlfriend about what happened, and I end up sitting guard outside the tent, in the darkness until daybreak. In the morning, I looked around a bit for signs of who or whatever it was, and I discovered a boot print in some soft, moist dirt not far from our tent. It wasn't mine, and it wasn't my girl's. This freaked me out as it confirmed that someone, perhaps more than one, was skulking around our tent in the dark. I kept it to myself because I didn't want to freak my girl out any more than she already was. At this point, we were pretty deep in and still had two days left. That day we walked a little faster than normal and covered as much ground as possible. When it came time to set up camp, I found a spot near a cliff where we could place the tent in a small overhang and prevent anyone from coming up behind us. The whole day up to this point I had a feeling we were being followed. I had no confirmation of this as I hadn't seen or heard anyone else, but it was just a gut feeling. We set up camp and made some food, then retreated to the tent. I assured my girl that if I slept at all, it would be with one eye open. After a while, she drifted off to sleep and I stayed awake listening to the sounds of the woods at night. I was awake for a few hours, just waiting to see if anything was going to happen. At some point, I guess my exhaustion caught up with me and I drifted off. I woke some time later to what sounded like someone going through our stuff outside the tent. I grabbed my gun and woke my girlfriend, shushing her to be quiet. From that faint glow of the fire, I could see someone's silhouette against the tent. There was really someone out there. I yelled out to them something along the lines of, We are armed. Get out of here. They dropped what they were doing and bolted. I came out of the tent, gun drawn and ready to shoot someone. Our stuff was strewn all about. They had rummaged through quite a bit of our stuff. I walked to the edge of the woods in the direction of whoever was out there had fled. There was a creek nearby and I walked to the edge, where there was a small trail running alongside it. Down the creek I could see a light. It looked like a lantern the way it flickered. Then I saw three more emerge from the other side of the woods. I told my girlfriend to start packing up whatever she could and that we are leaving now. We packed up everything of value, left the tent and a few other items and headed back onto the trail, in the middle of the night. I kept hearing people talking off in the woods and hearing branches snap from quite some ways. I kept looking behind us every few seconds to make sure nobody was coming up behind us. It was completely nerve wracking. If something happened, we were still a long ways from anywhere and quite literally on our own. Since we hadn't seen another hiker the entire time we had been out there, I really felt we were in serious danger. We had been walking for quite some time when I heard something in the woods behind us. As we rounded a corner, I turned around and saw someone step out onto the trail and just stand there watching us. It was just as the sun was coming up and barely any light. I couldn't make out any features, just the silhouette. I stopped and looked at them for a second and asked them who they were and what they wanted. They just stood there silently, watching us and then turned and walked back into the woods. We picked up the pace and kept going, looking back every so often. We didn't see them again, but my gut told me they were still there for quite a ways. We eventually reached the end of the trail and got to where we had parked my girlfriend's car, extremely exhausted. We made it out of the Virginia woods without becoming a meal for some group of people of whatever knows what. I have no idea who they were or what they wanted. Maybe it was just someone messing with us, I don't know. But I'll never know because I will never be returning to find out. This happened over a decade ago, somewhere in northern Michigan during the summer. My friend Kathy, my boyfriend's half-sister May, and I drove down from our hometown to visit friends, and we were on our way back home in Kathy's bad little car. By bad, I'm talking this thing had engine problems, overheating problems, ignition problems, it was constantly falling apart. More than once, it had stalled or just stopped working in the middle of the street while we were trying to get somewhere, but Kathy thought we'd be fine since we hadn't had any problems with it on the way to our friend's house. It's a little past midnight and we're roughly an hour away from home. 
There was nobody on the road, dense woods on every side, no street lights, no moon. I could barely see past the windshield because I have a form of albinism, which leaves me legally blind in my left eye and with really awful vision in my right eye. My death perception is terrible, and I can't see more than a few feet ahead of me at most, but usually I can make out lights and other cars when they pass, and sometimes street signs and people when they are close enough. We drove down this narrow, hilly road, and on the descent down a hill, the car makes a strange sound. Kathy starts braking, and we get to the bottom of the hill. The car quits working. Kathy swears and turns on the hazard lights. She and I get out of the vehicle and help pop the hood, which causes a bunch of smoke to fly out. After the smoke mostly clears, Kathy tries to figure out what went wrong this time. We stand in the dark for at least 45 minutes, maybe longer, before we realize she couldn't fix the car and needed a tow truck. These were the days of the MapQuest printouts and brick phones, so we couldn't whip out our smartphone and look up the closest tow truck. I decided to call my boyfriend Caleb to come pick us up and suggest we come with a tow truck to pick up the car when it was daylight. May and Kathy agree, so I take out my cruddy Nokia and called my boyfriend. It's then I realize, no service. I ask May and Kathy if either of them have service, they both check and shake their heads. May gets a bit panicky, and we all hold our phones up, trying to get a signal to no avail. It's really hot, and after failing to get any kind of service, we are all feeling a bit spooked and uncomfortable. May begs us to do something because she is more afraid than Kathy and I. Kathy attempts to call May down, and I wonder if the thick woods and hills are blocking out our reception. I tell May and Kathy to wait by the car, and walk away from them up the hill we had just come down, holding my phone out. Still no signal. I walk further and further away until I reach the top of the hill. I can't see the outline of our car anymore, but I can still hear May at a distance. Even at the top of the hill, I don't get a signal. I know it's gotta be the trees in the way, so I get the idea of climbing up a tree and calling from there just to see if it works. In hindsight, this was not my brightest idea, but me being an idiot. I saunter off into the woods in search of a climbable tree. At this point, I just want to go home, and this is the only thing on my mind. I find a nice tree with low branches and lift my body upwards towards the trunk. I climb the branches higher and higher, and about midway up the tree, I feel my pack of cigarettes fall out of my shorts pocket. I'm kind of annoyed, but figured I can just look for them when I climb back down. I take my phone out and hold it up once I get near the top. I have service. Relieved, I call Caleb, but he doesn't pick up, so I call again until he does. He answers in a sleepy, but pissed voice, but I'm having none of that and simply explain our situation. He asks where we are, and I give him the name of the road and my best guess as to how far along we are on it. He says he will be on his way and tells me to go back and wait with May and Kathy, then he yells at me for being stupid and climbing a tree in the dark with my bad depth perception. I assure him that I'm fine, he's skeptical but says okay, and we hang up. I start climbing down the tree, but my hand touches a big glob of sap, so I stop and try to wipe the sticky goop off of my shirt. I'm already sweaty and gross, so I'm not too happy about the sap. While I'm failing at getting rid of this crud off my hands, I hear the strangest sound from somewhere below me. Swish, swish, swish. I completely freeze, not being able to place what the sound is, but it's moving pretty fast. I stare down into the darkness below me, but can't see anything. Just hear this noise continuing. It comes closer and closer, and then I hear it right below my tree. Swish. And then it stops, right under my tree. I hold onto the branches as tight as I can and wait. I hear leaves shuffling and twigs snapping, and after a while that stops, and the weird noise starts again, but it's heading away from me deeper into the woods. I wait until I can no longer hear the sound, then finish climbing down and jump out of the tree. It's completely silent now, besides the sounds of the woods, so I grew up around on the ground for my cigarettes. I don't find them, so I make my way out of the woods and back towards the road. I jog down the hill, and when I reach the bottom, I notice May and Kathy are not standing outside the car anymore, and the hazard lights are off. I walk over to the car and May rolls on the window a little bit, and whispers in a panicked voice, Elizabeth, where were you? I point back over my shoulder towards the hill and started to explain that I called her brother, but Kathy yelled, what are you doing? Get back in the car. I give them a weird look, but Maya unlocks and opens the door and I crawl into the back seat with her, slamming it behind me. Kathy slams the locks and double checks them while May rolls up the window and makes sure the rest are rolled up. One of the windows has never closed all the way, but there's less than a finger space, so it's not too big of a deal, but May's freaking out about it and Kathy has lost her cool as well. I am still confused and asks what the heck is going on. Maya tells me that a bit after I went up the hill, some weird person came out of the woods and ran really funny up the hill in the direction I went. They got freaked out and turned the lights off and got in the car. They thought he had got me. I am honestly scared at this point because if I hadn't stopped to wipe sap off my hands, I most likely would have got out of the tree at the time I heard the weird noise. 
I just knew it was that person. I tell them my story, and everybody in the car is super scared, but are relieved that Caleb is on his way. We only have to play the waiting game now. We sit on the road for what seems like forever. The dread we were feeling made time seem like it was going slower than normal. Kathy and May are looking out the windows, surveying the area, and I'm just sitting there hoping Caleb will hurry up and come rescue us. Suddenly, I hear May whine, what is that, and she starts crying. Kathy snaps her head to where May is looking and stifles a gasp. I look where they are facing, I see nothing but the dark. But then I hear it through the small opening in the window. Swish, swish, swish. May ducks down, as though doing that will make her invisible, and Kathy hides her head behind the steering wheel. I follow their lead and sort of hunch down in my seat, but the noise comes straight up to the window. I can almost make out the silhouette of a tall, skinny man, and then he presses his face against May's window, and I finally see him. Nobody screams. You'd think we would, but it didn't happen. We all just stared at each other. He looks in at us for a while until Kathy switches her brights on hoping it would scare him off, but it did nothing. The dude just walked to the front of the car and stood in front of the headlights. Maybe he thought he could block us from leaving? I don't know. I couldn't make out his features very well, but the guy had to be somewhere a bit over 6 feet and no older than 30 years old. He had the face of your average Joe, nothing special. Nothing really sinister or particularly creepy that you notice about him if you run into this dude in broad daylight. Dark shaved hair, pale skin, long face. May said he had light colored eyes and stubble with eyebrows that made him look like he was always concerned, but there was no way I could make that out, so I had to take her word for it. What was really weird was it was like 80 degrees, and this dude was wearing corduroys, which is what the sound was, corduroys making that swishy sound when you walk, and an oversized sweater with abnormally long sleeves. The sleeves went over his hands and flopped back and forth as he paced around in front of the car. I'm not sure how long he was in front of the car, but it was a while. Then good old Corduroy starts doing something really bizarre. He bends his arms up towards his face, which I can only describe as looking like a praying mantis because of the way his sleeves were hanging, and then he begins walking circles around the car, rhythmically taking two steps forward, one step back like Willy Wonka but on speed or something. This is where I noticed the swish sound matched up exactly to the same sound I heard when I was back in the tree. He was doing the two steps forward, one step back in the woods, when he was going after me, as though this wasn't weird enough. By now, May was sobbing and Kathy seemed like she had to vomit, so I felt like I had to be the brave one. I looked at the slight space in the open window, and when he orbited his way over there, I said, hey man, can you just stop? You're really freaking us out. Quarter War definitely had heard me, so he switched to a halt and looked back into the car through the windshield, straight at me. I asked him very firmly to leave, and he took an extended pause, smiled, then Willy Wonka his way out of my line of vision into the darkness. After a while, Kathy said he disappeared into the woods, and May was like, I can't believe that worked. We awkwardly laughed about what a weirdo he was and glad he left and whatever, and we went back to waiting for Caleb, somewhat reassured but still paranoid. But after some time, Kathy said, oh no, he's back. I couldn't see, but apparently he was doing this two steps forward, one step back parallel to us on the side of the road, and this time he had a big tree branch he was holding with his sweater covered hands. May got scared again, and I held her hand so she'd feel better about it, even though I was ready to piss myself. It was awful, because I didn't know if he was coming towards us, or if he was moving away, or whatever he was up to. It was kind of like when you knew there was going to be a jump scare in a horror movie. Then I hear Corduroy switch back towards the Geo and on my window. He smacks it with the tree branch. May and I panic, and I scoot as close to her as possible. They see the dude back up into the woods, then come running back and slamming the branch back into my window like he's jousty with no horse. Thankfully, the window didn't break, but it got terrifying hearing swish, 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 clonk after a while, and he did this repetitively. Kathy perks up in her seat and starts pointing at the road ahead. I see headlights. She blares the horn and flashes the lights. Lo and behold, it's our savior, Caleb. He brought his older brother, Alex, and they both get out of his car and head over to us. May's sobs turn into joyous laughter as her brothers approach. Now Caleb and Alex have always been tall guys. Walking around with them was like walking around with high elves. It felt very safe. Caleb was 6 foot 8 and Alex is around 6 foot 5, so I thought two dudes taller than the corduroy jouster would make him leave. But nope. Caleb walks towards corduroy, trying to assess the situation, and Alex comes over to the car and taps on the window, tells Kathy to get out. She does and he walks over to his car. Then he comes back and puts the car in neutral so he can push it off to the side of the road. May and I slowly get out and May makes a bolt for her brother's car. I help Alex push the car to the side while Caleb distracts the corduroy jouster by holding the end of his stick and telling him to go away. Corduroy yanks the branch away from Caleb and starts backing up by going two steps backward, one step forward, and disappears into the darkness down the street. I can't see him, but Caleb can. 
The dude backs up pretty far and then comes launching at Caleb, who sprints the other way down the road because that stick could have really hurt him. He bumps past Alex, who had already got out of the car and was opening his car door, leaving me behind the car alone. Corduroy apparently changed directions and aimed the stick at me, but I couldn't really tell. I just hear everybody shout, Elizabeth. This startles me, and I jump to the side of the car, hearing Corduroy smash the stick into the back window with a loud thud and a swish. I take the long way around the car and sprint off into the road and feel Caleb grab my arm and tug me over Alex's car. I feel the wind has been knocked out of me and my legs don't seem to work, but Caleb manages to shove me in the back seat and scrambles into the passenger side. By now we are all safely in the car and Corduroy is standing like a mantis in front of the headlights again. He had abandoned his stick and just stood there with no intention to move. Alex puts the car into reverse and slams on the gas, making me knock my head against the door. Then makes the sloppiest U-turn ever and nearly drives us into the woods but gets us back onto the road. Everybody was in 100% panic mode as Alex tore away, far over whatever the speed limit was. Me and Kathy swear they saw Corduroy chasing behind us after Alex made the U-turn, but there was no way he was catching up. The next day, I went back there with Caleb, Kathy, and the dude from the tow truck place. There was no sign of Corduroy anymore, but when we approached the car, we saw that in the space where the window didn't close all the way were my cigarettes. The box was missing, but they were all neatly jammed in a row along the window space. I have no doubt it was the work of the corduroy jouster. To this day, I wonder if he knew I was up the tree and took my cigarettes, or if he thought I dropped them and went further into the woods to look for me, or if he just found them later and decided to stick them through the window, because he was weird. I also still wonder what his intentions were. I still have so many unanswered questions on that night. Several years ago, I was in a bit of a financial pickle. I was 21 with a bad job history, a bad job, and bad credit. My living situation went sideways and I had temporarily moved back home with my folks. As anyone who has ever had to move back home as an adult will tell you, this was a terrible situation. I was a rush to get back out on my own, which is why when my best friend, similar position in life at the time, told me that an apartment had opened up at her shady complex, I had actually jumped at it. If you're from around here, then you'll know that every apartment complex in that town is kind of shady. But for those of you who are not here, this place is a shady non-town outside of another non-town, with more liquor stores than any other establishment, and several apartment complexes with no credit checks and same-day move-ins. A couple of months went by, and while the cops did occasionally show up in our parking lot and you had to watch your step for more than one broken bottle, it wasn't the worst place to live. I worked the night shift at a large retailer, shuffling around freight in the back, hating every minute of every shift. So one night, while I trudged up and down a ladder like a zombie at work, my cell phone fell out of my back pocket at the top of the ladder. I grabbed at it, obviously missing, and died a little as I saw it smack the ground and go black. No amount of restarting or shaking could fix it. The LCD was completely shot. Well that's just great, I thought to myself, and decided this was a good enough reason to go home mid-shift. Remember that thing I said about bad job history? Yeah, you can clearly see why. Driving home, at 3am on some random weekday, I turned onto the dark back road that led to my apartment building. I saw something faintly up ahead, in the road, and immediately think it's someone's dog. I pulled up slower, praying that I wasn't coming up on someone's dead pet, and saw that there was actually a teenage boy laying on the side of the road waving. There was a bike laying in the dirt next to him. The kid saw me and jumped, weaving toward the driver's side of my car. Now, I may have made a lot of poor decisions at this point in my life, but thankfully, I hadn't gone completely brain dead. I locked the car doors, but cracked the driver's side window. Are you okay? What happened? Let me get some help. I got hit by a car. They left me. I need help. The kid looked dazed and was cuffed up, but something about him also set my nerves on edge. I'm gonna call for help, okay? I grabbed up my cell phone and then remembered the thing was basically useless due to its ladder plunge. My cell phone was broke, but I live nearby there, okay? I will get help. I hope he didn't think I was lying, but then I didn't care. The kid slammed his hand against my car. Just let me in. I need help now. I promise. I will get help and come back. Everything will be okay. I felt torn. I wasn't going to let this kid into my car, but at the same time, I couldn't blame him. If I was scared and hurt, I would probably be frantic too. The kid slammed his hand against the car again, and I started driving. I hadn't been exaggerating. It was a 30 second drive to my apartment. I didn't have a landline and I didn't want to somehow lead this kid to my empty apartment with no way of calling for help. I saw my best friend's boyfriend's car parked in her spot and immediately was thankful for the stroke of luck. I ran up the steps to her apartment and began banging on the door. Roy answered the door, probably expecting a crazy person, It was immediately even more alarmed to see me. What is going on? Why aren't you at work? I breathlessly explained that some kid had been hit by a car off the back road, but my cell isn't working and that I needed him to come back with me. Melanie, 
my best friend, emerged from her room, sleepy and equally confused. Roy immediately took charge, told us both to get into the car, and drove us back to the boy. The kid was still there, waving us down. Roy, a large man, Mel, and myself all got out of the car. Help. I need help. I'm here to help. My friends saw you and came and got me, okay? Calm down. I got jumped by this gang man. They beat me up and stole my backpack and rode off. The kid said frantically. I immediately became alarmed. That's not what he told me at all. I looked at Mel, my face clouding over. I thought you got hit by a car. Why did the gang jump you? What? Yeah, they beat me up and then someone hit me with a car. Plausible. I was still confused though. Roy also seemed very wary of this change in the story. Listen man, let me call an ambulance, okay? Can you tell me your name? The kid lost it. He screwed his face up and clenched his fist, hitting the side of his head. No, 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 no. Just let me in the car, man. Just take me to your house. Roy was done. That's not happening, kid. I'll call an ambulance, and the police, and I can wait with you till they get here, but we can't bring you back with us. The kid slapped the side of his head some more, and then in the most disturbing thing I've ever seen, grabbed fistfuls of his shaggy hair and began pulling it out of his scalp. The sound is still the most disgusting and alarming thing I've ever heard. Roy gave Mel and I the, let's get out of here face, and we jumped back in the car. I'm calling the police, okay? I will tell them you've been hurt and you need an ambulance. Roy began dialing, and the kids started stomping around and screaming. Take me to your house, just let me get in the car, why won't you take me home? The kid stood in the street, blood trickling from where he'd torn up his scalp. Roy got back in the driver's seat and spoke with the cops as the kid raged outside. He then came to the window, staring so intently at us that I felt like my skin had shriveled up and fallen off. He began kicking the tires, and Roy, clearly over it, drove off. The kid grabbed me frantically at the back of the car. Roy drove past our return around Peters Creek twice to avoid leading the kid to the apartment complex, and then back down our road. The kid was gone. The bike, the kid, just gone. No idea where he took off to. Clumps of his hair were still on the road. We never saw the kid again. We searched the papers and internet to see if he'd been picked up, or if any other strange things had taken place that night, but nothing else ever showed up. What confuses me still about all of it is why he would demand to come back with all three of us. One person could obviously be easily overtaken, but what were his plans for all three of us? In the early 80s, when I was 8, my family was visiting my uncle who lived in Backwoods, Missouri. He lived on a lot of land, and the only other people who really even lived on the street were relatives, so no one else ever just happened to be there. This meant no one ever really locked their doors, because random family members were always coming by for this or that. One night, while we were all there, my parents and aunt and uncle decided to go to a nearby town to go bowling, because bowling. My brothers, who were 11 and 12, my female cousins, 6 and 14, and I'm female, stayed home. It was still daylight when the adults left, but it started raining pretty hard and got dark quickly. We used to play this game that was essentially hide and seek in the dark house, but we called it Vampire. There was a thin little mattress on the living room floor that some of the kids would sleep on at night, so the person who was it would lie on the mattress and fold it over themselves like a coffin and count down to midnight. When they got to midnight, they were looking for you, again, all the lights are off, and you try to make it back to the coffin before you got caught. Because the house was in the country, it was pitch black at night. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. What this meant for the game was that, one, you couldn't tell where the vampire was looking, so you just had to make a break for it, and two, if you were extremely lazy, and I'm sure by now you can guess which one of us met those standards, you could hide in the living room with the coffin and get to base quickly. Ben, my 11 year old brother was it and was doing the normal countdown. I was hiding maybe 6 feet from him. As he's counting, there was a flash of lightning. I don't know if I was already looking at the living room window or if the lightning made me look, but with the backlight of the lightning, I see a man with his face against the window. He had his hands on each side of his face as if he's trying to peer in and looks exactly like the stereotypical creepster. Heavy set, scraggly beard, etc. I could feel every hair on my body standing on end. Immediately, I began trying to convince myself that I didn't see what I saw, but then Ben sternly whispered, if anyone is hiding in here, stay still. I sort of croaked out a, I'm here, right as there was another flash of lightning. Creepster was still there, but was no longer trying to look in the window. Instead, he was now looking toward the front door. Ben and I immediately knew what was coming next. From where he was standing, Creepster was probably only 5 feet from the front door. Ben was the same distance, but there was a couch between him and the door. Ben leapt over the couch and locked the door right as Creepster started trying the handle. At this point, I guess Ben decided that it was best to let the Creepster know that people were home and that we knew he was there, because he flipped on the porch light and then started turning on the lights in the house. This is going to sound weird, but I was too terrified to panic. Having said that, I was relying completely on Ben to know and tell me what to do. He told me to go lock the other doors and was yelling for everyone else to come out and to lock all the windows. Honestly, the next few minutes were hazy in my mind. I remember everything up until this point extremely clearly. 
Then I remember the end very clearly, but I'm less clear about the middle. I know that I locked the side door and then the sliding glass door in the back of the house. When we talked about it over the years, some people remember us seeing him out the back door as well. I don't think I remember that. What I clearly recall is locking the sliding glass door and standing there frozen and hearing Ben in a very calm but firm voice say, close the curtain, listen to me, okay, close the curtain. So I did. Ben can't remember that part and I just remember my fear in Ben's voice. So I'm not sure if I saw the creepster in the backyard or not. We tried to call the police, but my aunt and uncle had a stupid party line and it wouldn't work, either from the storm or from a neighbor leaving it off the hook or whatever. For the second, they are the only people I've ever known with a party line, so this wasn't normal to me either. But for those of you who don't know what that is, in really rural areas, multiple people on the street would actually share a phone line. It would have different rings for different households, but you could pick up on the phone and listen to your neighbor's conversation. We also tried to summon help on my uncle's CB radio, but couldn't reach anyone. My uncle was a hunter, so he had a gun rack full of rifles in his room, but my older cousin was on an out of town hunting trip and took them with him. All we could find was a BB gun that looked like a real rifle. I vividly remember Ben putting me on phone duty and Scott, my older brother, on CB duty, while he stood watch at the little square window on the front door with a BB gun. Maybe 30 minutes later, Ben said, he's back, he's coming up the driveway. The rest of us froze in fear, but Ben opened the front door and stepped out on the porch, pointed the gun and said, get out of here right now. Then we hear our cousin Kyle, who lived on the road a bit, say, You know that's a BB gun, right? Even though Kyle was only 15, I remember that we felt like we had been saved when he showed up. Kyle seemed really skeptical of our story, like we were playing a trick on him, even though we had no idea that he was coming, but he stayed with us until our parents came home. Honestly, I don't remember if we even told our parents what happened when they got home. There was definitely no police involvement, though. We just went on with our trip, but we never played Vampire again without some mention of that night. Alright, so that's it. I hope you enjoyed this compilation. Let me know down in the comments below if you want to hear another one of these compilations every once in a while. But as always, have a nice day.